Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Moment of silence, please. Flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mr. Calguire. Ms. Darmo. Here. Mr. Dovey. Here. Mr. Cameron Jenkins. Present. Mr. Phil Jenkins. Ms. Kara Manugian. Here. Mr. Litwack. Here. Mr. McLaughlin. Here. Ms. Tursich Keeley. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Would you please read the statement of adequate notice? Public notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act has been given as follows. By advertising the Burlington County Times and the Courier Post on July 28, 2021. By sending a notice to the Burlington County Times and the Courier Post on August 4th. Posting notice on school bulletin boards and main entrances on July 28th. Posting the notice electronically in the district website on August 4th, 2021. And by following written notice with the clerk of Delanco Township on July 28, 2021. Thank you. May we have public comment on agenda items only? I will open it up to the public for that. Okay, I do not see any comments from the public on any agenda items. So I'll close that. And we will now begin the work session agenda, starting with the presentation, the finance presentation, Exhibit B. Give me one second. You've got it. Everyone see that? Okay, thank you. Uh, so when Mr. Mersinger, Mersinger and I talked about the meeting, the whole idea is to replicate some of the committee meetings. And some questions came up about the finances. And also I knew there was something, there's an item on the agenda for next week that I wanted to discuss. So this is sort of like a mini finance meeting that would occur in the normal finance meeting of old, but now is occurring in public. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. Uh, I wanted to address a few a few things that have come up since June, some of the questions I've heard in June and July and so forth, as well as just give you my kind of my initial impression of some things uh, as I as you get a fresh set of eyes on the budget for this year and the future. So that's kind of where I'm going with this. This is our budget for this year, the operating budget. I want to make that clear. The operating budget is not the grants. It's not the, it's, it's strictly what we use to operate our curriculum, our facilities each year. And I wanted to throw, I wanted you to see this because it's a very unique budget compared to other districts that I've been in. And it's mostly because the top line, normally you have salaries and personnel costs around 70, 75, even 80%. But you can see in our district, our salaries and benefits, because we don't have a high school and things of that nature, our salaries and benefits are only about 45%. Whereas tuitions are 37% and actually more if you include the transportation costs associated with those tuitions. Of those tuitions, remember we pay Riverside for high school. So let's take out the 1.6 million that we pay Riverside. It's about $2 million in just out of district placements. And I, I wanna make it clear tonight that when I talk about out of district placements, I am not talking about the needs of the children. I'm just simply talking in dollars and cents. So we can look at the budget from that perspective. Um, I can pers I personally have, you know, so, someone in my family that needed those kind of services. So I'm not, I'm not trying to put any spin on this outside of the fact that 
we have a high out of district tuition cost that is difficult to control because of programs we don't have in the district right now. So, so that's the only reason why I mentioned that. With this, there are a couple of things I want to point out. The first thing I've already pointed out is that $2 million is going to out of district tuition costs, which is something which when we get a like for today, I got a contract today for another hundred thousand dollars. It's something which we cannot control because if you don't have the programs in place in our district, we cannot move into that program. So we're kind of at the at the mercy of the districts that we're trying to place them in, which is which means it's very difficult for us to to handle that. The second part I want everyone to understand about this this operating budget. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page going into not just this budget year, but also in a couple of months, we're gonna start talking about the next, sorry, talking about the, first, the next year's budget, 22-23. So in this budget, each year, and I have a slide later on, we, we have a portion of the budget, we have a budget fund balance. Now, what is budget fund balance? Basically, it is a surplus from one year that's then used in a future year's budget. So it's not really surplus because our budget depends on that money. So when we look at this budget, we have $424,000 of budgeted fund balance of, of money that was automatically budgeted from, from two years ago's budget. Also in this year's budget, we moved 325,000 of operating costs, which consisted of facility salaries, benefits, supplies, and a counselor salary to one of the federal grants. So imagine what happened in May with the federal cut or with the cuts that, that were made. In reality, we also took 325,000 and moved it to a grant so we didn't have to cut as much. That money eventually has to come back into this operating budget. That's why I'm bringing that up. My goal is not to think one dimensionally about the budget in terms of just what's going on right now, but to also think about What's going to happen next year and the, and the year after? This is our projected tuition costs right now. And I say right now, as I mentioned, today we received, I actually received three or more contracts today. So I was able to update this data today. This, this changes. When I initially put the presentation together, we were actually negative 15,000. Now we're plus 71, and then after the contracts we got today, I, get, I can tell you we're back in the negative again. So the point being is as contracts come in, this data gets more accurate, but because it's, these tuitions could be ranged from 15,000 to 100,000, it can swing things very quickly. So I wanted to put this together for two reasons. This is something that I do monthly. So when I do my monthly processes, there's certain things that I do after I reconcile all the books. I do a cash flow. I check out how the salaries look or projected to make sure they weren't targeted to meet all their salary, salary budget lines. But I'm also, because this district is so dependent on tuition costs, I'm now analyzing this on a monthly, I will be analyzing this throughout the year on a monthly basis to see how we're projected out because these numbers change, especially at the beginning of the year. So I'm just, there's nothing here that I can really say. All I can tell you is that we're still waiting a few more. We're still waiting on contracts. I did put last year's contracts into it for those students who were budgeted. So we have an idea of what this projection would be, but we're still waiting for the actual contracts. And the still have a few students out there who are pending IEP and placement evaluations. So the situation could get a little bit dicier. On the flip side, we may have gotten some good news. We're waiting on some good news that potentially someone's gonna come back. So we'll see. I mean, like I said, this is still in flux, but I want you to realize I do this on a monthly basis, and actually on a weekly basis right now because contracts are coming in, but it will be done on a monthly basis. I also want you to realize, just in case you, you see this, if you notice the number at the bottom of this slide of 3.698 or 3,698,190, oh my God, I can't talk, 3,000,000, $698,193. That's different than the number in the first slide. The reason why, just so no one gets confused by this, is these numbers on this slide are based on the adjusted budget, meaning 
the IDA grant, we gain money from that. Like when we budget, we always budget a little less. We got a little extra money from the IDA grant. So that money is incorporated in those slides and any adjusted transfers or whatever are incorporated in, that, in this slide. So when, my initial impression is this. Obviously it's, it's no secret that we had some budget issues for this year. We had significant cuts. So what, what, do we, what do we need to do? And so Mr. Mersinger and I have talked. Obviously number one is we need to stabilize the tuition cost. How can we do that? Our goal is to bring back programs. That takes time. It also takes startup funds. So that's gonna be a long-term solution. And our goal is over the next two to three years, try to keep expanding those programs. Short term, I have, a, I have something to show you on Extraordinary Eight, which is unorthodox, but something which I think is what we should be doing. It's on the board of Jennifer the 18th as well, and I'm going to explain that. And that was the one question that came up from a couple of board members that I responded to this morning. We also have the ARP IDA funds that just came in. It's not a significant amount, but I will show you those. And we also have the ARP funds that came in at the end of last year, but we still have to determine what we're going to put into the actual grant that I'll discuss a little bit. And I also just want, want you to realize I'm going to continue to always monitor the fund balance monthly. Um, that's something which I have a spreadsheet for. And I always keep track of it. Um, you can call me a little anal, but that's what I am. So this slide is going to be the most confusing slide for, for people. Um, there's two parts to it. I want you to see both. Can I point? Yeah. I'm going to use my cursor to point for a second because I want to start to the right with budget and fund balance. Imagine when you build a budget, let's pretend you get a tax return in March. That's $1,000. And you decide to treat your family to a vacation, a one-time vacation to the shore or whatever. And the next year, you don't, have, you don't get that refund, so you don't go on vacation. You can cut the vacation out. It was a one-time expense. On the flip side, you have a tax return that's $1,000, but you buy food with it. And the next year we don't get the thousand dollars, what do you cut? You cut the food. And that obviously can become a problem because when you spend fund balance on your needs to operate, it can eventually come back and bite you a little bit. And I wanna show you what I mean by that here. So in 1718, this is how much was budgeted. So think about it this way. That was a surplus from years before that. Now look at 1920 is where it gets a little confusing. That was the actual surplus from 1718's budget. It's always a two year delay. Reason why is 1718 closes, it gets audited during 1819 and then it gets budgeted in 1920. So, if you look at these two numbers, what this tells me is you budgeted 1.5 million, but that year you only ended up with 1.1 million. So you actually lost $400,000 on your surplus, if that makes sense. If you, look, if you keep doing that pattern, 1819 and 2021, you actually gained a little bit in surplus. That was a good year. If you look at 1920, and look at 21, 22, those two years, that was what, what happened. Look at the difference. You went into 1920 with one point, almost $1.2 million, but it dipped down, lost my mouse, it dipped down almost $600,000, $700,000. Therefore, the budget this year automatically lost all that amount. And you know, and you know as well as I do, when you have a $10 million budget, if you lose $700,000, there's no way you weren't, you weren't going to lose salaries, benefits. Those are things that are going to have to go, and that's what happened. To me, from an outsider's perspective, one month being here, that was the biggest problem that, we, that occurred. Now, again, that's the risk where we're playing when we budget fund balance for needs, for food, and out of vacation. Every district does it to a certain degree. My goal in the future is to see how we can balance the needs and one-time things to make that safer for us. But it's gonna take time to do that. But that has to be our goal 
And so now let's go back to my extraordinary aid idea. Here's a potential surplus coming out of the 21, 2021, last year. It's approximately a million dollars. Again, we haven't had an audit yet. So I'm giving you a number that is off a of board secretary report. It's not the actual number right now, but that is the potential number, right? One million. Again, that means we lost about 381,000 from two years ago. But anyhow, that means that money will go into the 22-23 budget. Not this year, next year's budget. So that budget next year will be better from a fund balance perspective than this year's budget. Can you see that? So the extraordinary aid, I'm gonna connect this all to that at the end. The extraordinary aid, we had budget $20,000. We received $184,000. You can't take fund balance and budget into the next year. You can't take 2021 fund balance and budget in 21, 22, not allowed, because it has to be audited. But there's a statute that allows extraordinary aid that was not budgeted in the 2021 to be used and appropriated immediately in 21, 22. In other words, I can appropriate the difference here into this lower number. I can take the 160-ish, put it into the lower number, and at least bring up our fund balance for 21-22 to try to keep us a little bit more in better shape right now. And that's the goal. That's, it's a, I check with the auditors. I check with the county. They all said we can do this. So I, I didn't want to rely simply on my interpretation of the statute. I checked with my higher ups. Um, so with that, here's what uh, we're looking does at. Does everyone understand what extraordinary aid is? Could you, could you define that for us yeah, all? You're not a problem. Extraordinary it's, aid? Yes. Each year, in about April or May, we file an application for extraordinary aid. It is special education expenses that go above and beyond a certain limit. The most popular uses of that extraordinary aid are, for example, private school tuitions for out-of-district placements. If they're above a certain number, we get a certain portion of that extra in state aid. But you never know how much you're going to get. So in a budget, we always under budget that number because it's, it's something which we don't, we don't apply to until April of the year. We don't receive it until next September after the budget year is actually over. So you don't want to actually count on 180,000 and then get 50,000. You know, it, it wouldn't work that way. So we always under budget it. But because there's such a significant amount and because the fund balance is so low in this current year and it looks better for next year, that's why we're recommending it. But yeah, it's, it's extraordinary expenses spent on special education expenses spent on certain, has to be within certain conditions though, um, that we apply for and hopefully get some funding back for that purpose. So Mr. Mercer and I were, 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 we were looking through the budget initially and thinking about different things we could put back into the budget with those funds from the cuts. But as we were doing that, two other significant needs came across my desk. One is we're trying to develop the MD program. And the MD program will save us money. But as you saw, I already removed those students from the tuition projection, which was already pretty much a break even right now. And actually might be a little bit negative after today. So our goal is to give the startup cost, at least a portion of it from the MD program, to start up so that we can start containing some of the out of district placement costs for, for the kids from K to two, from the students from K to two. That's what, that's what the supplies are for. The benefits or half of the benefits would be for and the special education teacher for the MD program. The other one is we have a need for a pullout replacement teacher. And if we don't hire another teacher, we will have more out of this replacements. It's like a catch 22. So the extraordinary aid in some ways is allowing us to try to keep the tuition costs from getting even even more, to increase even more. So that's why on the agenda, I think it was letter O. That's why 
we are trying to reappropriate these funds because without these two positions, the budget, one, it's developing a program that will end up saving us money short-term and long-term, as well as help try to contain some of the tuition costs in the, on the immediate year. Two meetings ago, Mr. Litwack mentioned some funds for, for special education. We did receive the totals about a week ago. Um, it's not much, but it's something, and every little bit counts. Um, it is a portion of the American Rescue Plan, but it's, it's specific to the IDA. So we can use it for basically special, special education cost. Since the IDA grant always goes towards tuitions. My initial thought was if we were to, if we were to receive like 200,000, that would help us develop more programs. But with 21,000, we might as well just put it back towards tuitions and just keep putting it there where we know we have the cost anyway at this point. Um, it's just not sizable enough to really help develop future programs. Just, it pays for one third of the teacher almost, you know, it's, it's not enough. And it'll still help us containing our tuition costs anyway. The last slide I wanted to kind of to show you is the ARP grant in general. This is not the IDEA grant. This was a separate money that was designated to us or given to us probably last May. And what I put in here is when we, when we developed the budget in last May, we cut funds from the operating budget and put it into the ESSER two funds. Now, if we don't put in the ARP funds, it would mean next year we need to fund it immediately, next year being 22, 23. So we would need 325, $350,000 in 22, 23, put back into the operating budget. Right now, I'm almost just putting that right into the ARP grant, hoping to give us a two year window of this federal grant kind of saving us a little bit and then putting it back in the operating budget with a plan, 23-24. If you take that money out along with the learning loss allocation, which must be 20%, we're left with about $177,000. Over the next couple of weeks, we've already had initial conversations. Joe and I are talking about how we should use the, the remaining funds. I one point we have to make clear, we've been using this for reoccurring costs, which are going to, the grants are going to go away, and then we have to put it back in the budget. Ideally, we'd be using the grants for one-time expenditures, so when it goes away, we would have a, we'd have a safety net, but we are, we are having a tough budget right now. So our goal is to take the remaining 177, 178, and try to do it try not to have any further obligations in the 23, 24 budget, meaning one-time purchases. One of the ideas that came up just the other day was something that what we need is for, for the food service. We need probably extra support, teaching support, like extra personnel support during lunch periods. We may have to have more lunch periods. As, as a COVID issue, once COVID's gone, we wouldn't need to do that anymore. That would be a one-time cost where we can maybe hire a few extra aides for lunch periods, or if we have to pay, pay teachers during those periods, in some way we'll try to make things work to have our lunch periods covered so we can make sure everyone's safe while they're eating lunch. Um, we'll also reach out to our facility department, tech department. As all of you are aware, the first, it's very hard to budget new servers, a new HVAC system, those things are always the first thing out of a budget, especially when you're having tough budgets. This would be a great time to be potentially use as a one-time cost to try to upgrade something that we need to do and we just don't have the funds to do right now. Uh, so we're looking at those things. There's nothing at all. We have ideas, but nothing is secure right now. But I wanted to share that with you. So when we talk about the ARP grant, it's important to realize though that the majority of it is really already allocated unless we put the facility and the counselor back into the operating budget next year, which would be lovely, but we don't know if that's feasible at this time. So 
that was the, that's what I wanted to share with you. I, I just wanted to kind of outline the different things that have come up in June. So people were asking about the fund balance and the surplus. So I wanted to address, like, answer that question, bring it back a little bit. I also wanted to address some of the, you know Mr. Ditwack's comments about the ARP money that came in the twenty one thousand. And obviously, I wanted to address just some of my initial impressions of the budget and how it's a very difficult budget. And um, it's really just my goal to really keep it, keep analyzing it and just, you know, we'll go from there. This is, this is a very difficult budget to work in. It's, it's a very, it's a very fluctuating budget with very little, I hate saying control, but it's, I feel like it's a very, it's a hard budget to control. And that's what, that's, that's the worrisome part of it. I, I am open. I, I'm a former teacher, so I, I have no problem with questions if you have questions. Um, I have a question, Dear Adarmo. Um, I'm looking at the draft agenda letter O, and it says approve the appropriation um, of a, around $159,000 of the non appropriated extraordinary aid. Um, but you also mentioned a figure of $184,000. Yes. So it's, is that because um, that's the 159 is, um, yeah, I just don't understand those two figures. Yeah, the, the 184 is how much we received. You, you can only do what's over the budget amount. So we can't do 184. It'd be 184 minus 20, which is 164,601 dollars. We could go up to that limit. I'd rather be a little safe, but a little bit under just because this is a very unorthodox move. But Theoretically, we should be able to go up to $164,601. Okay, and then what would be the leftover? What would we use the leftover money? Are we? It's not the leftover. It was, it was budgeted revenue for, 21, for 2021. Okay, and my other question is looking at letter O. Um, you were talking about, could you go a couple slides back when you were um, giving the figures for, yeah, the special education? Okay. So on the draft agenda, I do see the um, 50,000 for benefits. I see the 5,000 for supplies. I see the, um, the salary for the special education teacher for 50,833. And then for items number uh, one and number two for letter O, I see two separate um, figures for around 26,000. Yeah, those two add up to 53,483. So that that's okay. So that's that you split it for that special education the, teacher. The teacher is being utilized in both Pearson and Walnut. So from an accounting standpoint, I have to account for it correctly and budget for them in both in both schools. So I have to budget them 50% in each, in each school. Okay. And my last question is if you could go back to where you um you had some figures for special education, and I remember there's something about budgeted and and you had listed, um, if you go back again, it, it says something like there was a student. Yeah, that one. Okay. So there's the column budgeted and projected. Does yes. budgeted mean those were the students you knew that you had from last school year? So, so you budgeted them. Uh, yeah, what I did, no, what I did is the bud, it was the, it's the adjusted budget for this year's budget. I didn't break it down by student. So imagine in, the account number for the LEA regulars, right? We have budget 1.287, that number. Um, right now we're projecting 1.2 million. So we're a little under. Okay, um, oh, I can't oh, I can't see with that figure. I wanted to deal with something very specific. So budgeted, the comp for budgeted is, isn't that basically the students you already knew you had, so you already could budget for them. Is that no? It would have been what was, yeah. So when you do a budget, you create, you create estimates for those students that you know about. Um, okay, but but I, I'm saying these figures here, I just simply took the total on those budget lines. Okay, so for the, the two students Theoretically, yes, who, it's, it's those students. I believe we had two students who had to, um, to be uh, budgeted for the commission of the blind, but they, we had them for last school year. We had two from last school year. So why is there only the one that I see here? Those numbers, I didn't develop the budget, but those numbers usually come from the state. So at that, at that point, the state, you should have given that number and you should have budgeted. No, but you know what I'm talking about? Because I remember at one meeting we were saying, oh, we have two students who are going to, um, I forget the name of the school, Vera, but it was for blind students. Vera, you're, 
you're mistaking that with a different topic. Okay, could you and clarify? We discussed it. It's it's personally identifiable information related to those students that I would recommend the board not discuss. Okay, I'm just wondering do if I understand what budgeted and projected means. The, the budget is simply the number that was actually put in the actual 2122 budget. Those account numbers. The projected okay. is simply me looking at a spreadsheet and simply estimating those amounts, whether or the actual amounts based on the contracts and projecting the amounts of those we haven't received the contracts for based on previous, previous okay. years. So I don't want to say anything identifiable. It just seems like I saw something where there was the commission only, of the blind yeah. that, that's that, given right by the state. So there's really nothing you can do at all about those items. Okay, just like I'll, state I'll facilities, talk about that about. off uh, like through emails then. Okay, thank you. Those were my questions. It, is that is can you hear me? Can I? Yeah, yeah, hi, yes. Okay, but isn't that because uh, the I guess it looks like from what I'm reading it was one student that was budgeted for at 2100, but there's two two students that were paying 2200 for it. Exactly. That, that's what's happening. Is that what's correct? Happened. Is that that's a happened, simplified yes. way to understand it? Yeah. yeah. That's what happened, yes. Yeah. And is the projected budget that's, it, it, it can, can we think of it as a sliding ongoing budget? Here's what we budget it, but because you're projecting what will be happening down the road that you keep putting it in here so that the budget is alive at any one moment. That's, that's why I said I analyze this stuff on a monthly basis, and right now I'm probably on a weekly basis. I yeah, I, I'm just, so, but, so uh, we all understand that yeah. the same way. So like I said, I adjust this this morning based on new contracts. I adjust it constantly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll have a better, I mean, September gives us probably a better estimate. It's hard to predict right now because things are still kind of up in the air. Uh, as I said on the one side, I can't read it fully because I have this, the Zoom screen here, but we're missing 12 out of 16 special ed contracts from LEAs. I have projections from last year, but those may be slightly off or slightly, I mean, who knows? Um, so we don't really have all the, all those, all this data yet, but this is where I'm at as of today. And that's why I constantly update it because I don't want to be caught off guard on anything, especially something that makes up three point, almost $3.7 million budget. No, that's a wise move. And it helps us if we can understand yeah. it to be able to understand what's going on at all times now. Yeah. And then what we're working toward in the future. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, the ARP IDA grant, yes. uh, so it was like 21,000, 20, yeah, 20, whatever it was, 20, 21,000. Do you know if that's like average uh, for a school district like ours? I, or you know what? I, I don't because I never saw, usually they send us a printout of like all the different fundings for like everybody, but it, when it comes to IDA, they normally don't. So I never saw it. Like for the American Rescue Plan, they sent out a whole, everyone knew what everyone else received. And we were all like, oh my God, look how much money that district got. How much, <laughs> this, yeah. this didn't work that way. They didn't okay. release it that way. It was only released in the actual e wig which is where you put the grant as system. Mm -hmm. So I could not tell you. Um, it has, I mean, it's obviously based on the IDA grant, I, I, would, I would assume, whereas the original ARP grant was based on the ESEA grant. Which is mm -hmm. Title One, Title Two, II, Title Four, so there are different different ways those grants are kind of you know done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I was a little excited for the. the, the I, I made sure I logged in right away, and when I saw the news, I was like, oh, "This isn't what I was yeah, expecting." It's almost like a slap in the face. Um, all right, um, it still helps. It still helps. Definitely, I'll take twenty one thousand um, yeah, dollars. My other question is: Is there a any con to placing the extraordinary aid into the 21-22 budget? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I contacted, so again, I, I've, I've been in education for a while. I've been, I was a teacher and then I was a BA and I've been a BA for a while you know, for us so many years and I have a pretty good network. And I, I called out, emailed several BAs. I was like, hey, you guys ever done this? And he said, no, you can do it, but uh, never did it. And, um, and then one BA goes, I said, really? awesome idea, but never did it. <laughs> you know, so, so kind of what you're saying, I'm like, yeah, but 
I don't like always being the, the person who pushes the limits on something, but there is always a drawback. Absolutely. And the drawback is you're not putting into, you're not, let me get my cursor out here so I can show you. This, this number would be higher. Ah. This number here would be higher at 1 million. If that turns out to be our surplus audit, that would be almost $150,000, no, even more, maybe $160,000 higher, right? For me, the budget, we need an MD program. We need to start this. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if we don't even do the, the um, holdout position, that also result in more out-of-district tuition. So like, if you don't spend the money now, you're gonna spend it probably with tuitions instead. So is there a drawback? Well, yeah, your surplus next year takes a little bit of a hit, but your surplus is so low. And I shouldn't use the word surplus, budgeted fund balance, or, or maybe budget surplus, if you want to break it down that way. It is, if you, if you move from the budget, you don't have money for the budget. You know what I mean? Like it's important to understand that. So it's, it's, it's like more like thinking about it as an investment back in the school now, as opposed to just trying yes. to play catch up later. And that's, when I think, I think it was Stephen who asked a question in June about the capital reserve um, resolution on the agenda. And he asked about, you know, we shouldn't use surplus right away. Like, no, well, you can't use surplus right away because it has to get audited. And then, it's, then our budget depends on that for future years. So when we, when we, when we don't have our certain numbers, we are actually hurting future year budgets. And one thing we need to talk about when we do next year's budget is what number do we want there? Because we have to adjust our zero balance. So like, imagine zero in Celsius is freezing, but 32 degrees is Celsius in Fahrenheit. Well, our budget isn't at zero. If we wanna keep our budget healthy, it should be similar to where our surplus is expected to be at. So we move the zero mark to that number for a healthy. So if we're budgeting a million dollars next year in budget fund balance, and we say our magic number is try to keep a surplus around 700,000, then the other 300,000 should be one-time purchases that we can cut on the following year budget. Does that make sense? So we want to budget, we want to come up with our magic number. And then each year we're going to take that zero and then once I hit 700,000 or whatever I hit 500, whatever that magic number is, that's when I'm going to start panicking. Not at zero, I, I panic at 500,000. So that's, that's kind of the difference. So you ask me, is there a con? Yes, your, your, your fund balance for the 22-23 budget is not going to be as high. But your fund balance in 21-22 is so low. I mean, look at it. You're at 1 million in every year. And then they, this year it's just 424,000. I also believe if you don't do it, you're going to spend this money anyway, but in tuition costs, and, and this won't be in the budget anyway. I, I, I'm not someone who liked this maneuver from a, giving it a shot, but I think when you look at the numbers, it makes sense in this situation, and I think this is probably one of those situations where we actually are doing a healthy, I, I, think, I, I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't think it was healthy. Honestly, like I, I am a very straightforward, I think it kind of shows this, this presentation. I don't, I'm not, I'm not beating around the bush here. I wouldn't put it on this slide if I didn't think this is the best move for us right now. Simple as that. It, Thank you. It, seems to, it seems to me we're reestablishing footing in a way to, to, to get out of where we are now. And in the mean, you know, as long as we understand that, I think that's uh, perfectly, seems like a perfectly sound way to do it from the numbers I'm looking at, the thought processes behind it. And if everybody hears the same thing or understands it the same way, that'll be helpful moving forward. And would if you can play devil's advocate with yourself, though it's not always, you probably have to, to get to this point, uh, but what might be the downside? What, if anything, is potential, you know, downside? 
Uh, like I said, you're, you're reducing the budget of fund balance, but I honestly think if you think about it, think about it this way, the 23, 24 budget, if our surplus in our budget's only this in 21, 22, and we've been losing surplus each year, I'm worried about the fund balance in 23, 24, <laughs> to be very yeah, honest yeah. with you. Um, and I can't predict that at all right now. But, yeah, and we, you know, and we saw how we're a very different budget uh, district as far as budget where where things go because we don't have a secondary school we're only k to so, eight and and you know we're a third of our budget is out the door just sending kids to high school i thought about this a lot i thought i've been thinking about a lot of things a lot i mean i'm at the water park with my kids thinking about pulling out my phone doing a spreadsheet real quick because i'm trying to think of numbers so here for me, you're going to keep here. The reason why I'm bringing up this presentation is I want us to talk about this fund balance, not just now. But when we hit October, November, December with this budget, I want to talk about next year's budget and how we budget that fund balance because I am worried about 23, 24. And I want us to make sure that when we budget next year, we start, we start thinking about how can we keep our budget sustainable long term especially as these grants roll off. So I don't have all the answers today, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm placing the seeds for conversations, for the budget conversations. And I don't start the budget in January. I start my budget in September and October. So you're gonna start hearing and, me talk about the budget in October. Probably. Am I correct? What is it, the October 15th uh, student is count? Mm -hmm. That is it the 15th, 30th? When's the... Yes. 15. 15. Yeah, that that on that date, then we know what are the numbers that we're working with for the year, as well as sure. anything additional that comes that you're people enrolled. moving you into the enrolled. district. You know your enrollment numbers, yes. Yeah, that's the enrollment that that so that other people understand that that that's how that's established. It it, it becomes based on real numbers, just like the projected numbers for what we're kids were sending to Riverside and then what they actually are based on the number of kids and if they're special ed and formulas that are worked out. So it's that if we can understand the process so that some of the questions people might have are answered and can see it in a, a flow of a, a school year budget. And it's something that I would like to introduce to our working group which is building a budget with your board. And if we can work from that, it, it sets up. It was, um, this was something that came through the school boards association. I helped to, I don't wanna take us off this topic, but I think it would be very helpful, the budget calendar and how to do it. And so that everyone understands where we are in the process. And that if you wanna jump ahead, you're just gonna be confusing not only yourself, but everyone else. So I think it was something I think could be helpful. I, I remember bringing him back. This was at one of the county meetings and it was put together by Marie Goodwin, who's the business administrator, board secretary at Medford. And this was the budget development manual for 2019, 2020. So this is the process of dates, et cetera. I'm talking about the working group that this will be helpful for us all being on the same budget timeline guideline. So I would like, I don't know that we've established any kind of format ruling, et cetera, for the working group, but um, I don't know if we want to do it now or do it. I think let Steve finish his presentation and then I'm for us to so use this as a, kind of a template of education for ourselves and to guide us forward. No, I, I'm done. I, I thank you guys for this initial presentation from me. I, uh, I, uh, like I said, I'm, I was a former teacher, so I kind of enjoy um, talking. So um, I thank you for that. And uh, I'll turn the meeting back to Marissa so you can kind of go from there and keep going. Marissa, right. uh, Marissa, now that the meeting's back in your hands, uh, could I speak for a moment about what Steve just shared? Yes, please. <clears throat> okay. 
thank you. Just two quick points. The first is, uh, board members, I have shared some confidential information with you uh, via email related to one of the questions that was asked. And again, you know, we just want to avoid any kind of identifiable information for students during a public meeting. But I did share that uh, with board members uh, based on the question related to Commission for the Blind. So another thing uh, that I wanted to mention here, and thank you to, to Stephen for doing this, is Stephen Burns for doing this is, you know, we've been discussing these topics for weeks and weeks now. And one thing that I really wanted Stephen to include was the information about the ARP funds, because when it was announced in March and discussed further in April and May and so on, a, a lot of people saw it as, wow, look at all this money that we're receiving and we can do all sorts of fantastic things with it. And the that is possible at times to use the funding for that. But based on what Steve and I are looking at in the budget, in order for us to maintain certain programs, especially related to the grant funded programs we already have in the current budget, a lot of the ARP funds have to go to that. So that's why, you know, if, if we were at a state where our budget were a lot healthier, we could then meet and say, well, let's come up with some great ideas for the ARP funds. But at this stage, those funds are being used to help keep the budget sustainable. So it's just a different mindset that we had approach to approach it from versus using the funding for additional. Instead, we're using that funding to sustain what we already have. So. I, I noticed uh, lost learning that one of the things, it was like 20% of the funding had to go to lost learning, learning loss. Mm -hmm. The other 80%, where is that coming from? Is that uh, I'm hoping we're doing it. That's what I guess I'm getting at. <laughs> the other percent was the remaining part, the remaining, remaining portion. So it was, uh, yeah, with some with the our fund that twenty percent had to go to learning. Loss. learning so the other eighty percent was already was everything else that was right. Mm -hmm. And what my question is the eighty other the eighty percent other that isn't coming from that we're providing. Am I correct? Uh, I'm sorry, no. I think, Harry, oh. what you might be asking is, why aren't we providing 100% for learning loss? And that's just, that's not an allowable usage of the, well, I guess it is, but we're required to use 20% for learning loss, but then the other 80% is being used for other aspects of. That's teaching. what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. But included in that might be some aspects of however it's used to benefit students that had learning loss. A lot of times what we do with that, and I don't want to, I don't want to make any plans right now when it comes to that particular topic, but it's, it's a matter of, uh, I'll use Title I as an example. Sometimes we receive the Title I funds from the federal government, and what we do is we use that to fund salaries for staff members that are providing supplemental instruction support, such as basic skills, and, and, and over the years, we've sometimes had up to three people doing basic skills, and then down to one person doing basic skills based on the amount of funding we receive and the amount in the general fund as well. So it just depends on the nature of that. But um, you are right, you know, that that 20% is something that can be discussed further. You know, Steve and I would, would definitely be discussing that further to see, is there a way to use that funding for, for things in our general fund uh, so that our general fund becomes healthier based on that? And again, it would still be based on that learning loss uh, requirement, like we're saying. Uh, uh, mine is from the educational point of view of let's make sure that whatever we can do to uh, rekindle students learning abilities and that learning loss is made up and sometimes no amount of money you throw at that can help. So but it's the idea of I just wanted to clarify in my head that that 20% were that's dedicated to that and the Whatever, if they were expecting with that money, the other 80% isn't going to that. It's, it's clear, and I think everyone understands the point. Yeah, and also, Harry, just to let you know and let the board know and the public know, we discussed this a little bit in previous meetings that the ESSER II funding that we received, uh, that had to be earmarked for, uh, they're not calling that learning loss, they were calling that uh, enrichment, uh, but, but no matter what we call it, uh, some some are calling it remediation, but that's not really the word that is being called right now. The point is, 
we've, we've already developed a plan for that where we're going to have after school uh, skills labs for English language arts as well as STEM. So that's something we're already going to be putting in place with that funding because they said, here's the money, we need you to use it for STEM and ELA. And we said, okay, we'll use it for STEM and ELA and, and develop those plans. But the same thing with this is, you know, when they say learning loss, it's a little bit more generic and we do have opportunities to use it for other things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Okay. If there's no further discussion on the finance presentation, we'll move forward with the discussion on the draft agenda for August 18th, 2021, Exhibit C. Did everybody have an opportunity to review the draft? It's pretty much what we normally have, you know, for the most part, the normal beginning aspects of the meeting, the approval of previous minutes, accepting this board secretary and treasurer reports, which we got clarification of that via email as what those positions truly mean and who represents those positions. Community liaison reports, that is normal. Um, I'm, and then the welcome message. We wouldn't have student recognition at this point in time since the kids are not in school. The normal aspect of public comment on agenda items, items that are on the agenda the superintendent's report and the, and the items that he, Mr. Mersinger adds so that we can review it. Which so are all just a note about that, Marissa, mm -hmm. superintendent's report. Uh, we, what you'll see there is kindergarten registration, 22 students as of last week mm -hmm. and receiving more registrations in, in the next few weeks. We're certain of that because uh, Eileen Grinnan, the new secretary is saying that we're receiving multiple registrations per day. So that's typically what happens is certain people register ahead of time and other people will register in August. We have some that register on September 1st and so on. So we will still be seeing an increase in that number for kindergarten registration. So just, just a note for the board that it's it's not only 22, we, we are projecting more than that. I'm, I'm foreseeing that it's gonna be in the thirties at least. I have yeah. a question about Just the superintendent's that. report. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked over the report and I did see that you talked to uh, Mr. Mr. Marini or Dr. Marini, the um, county superintendent. Um, when you were talking to him, did, did you mention that you needed something from him in writing that you referenced at the last meeting about the removal of the principal position in the superintendent's contract? You said you wanted to get something in writing from the last meeting. Did you talk well, to him about that? Well, it wasn't me requesting anything in writing. Uh, Vera, you had, in, you had initiated some type of question to the school ethics board, as far as I recall, and they have discussed it with the county office. And then Ray Marini briefly discussed it with me saying that at some point, there is going to be some kind of written report given to the district based on whatever ruling is given okay so so basically he is going to put something in writing for us um why is why is that being delayed well i i don't the the, the executive county superintendent certainly doesn't answer to me or to our district so uh that's not really an easy uh question to answer so he said they need to investigate is that what he said I, what did he say? Could you recap again? I would really rather not. Uh, I mentioned this in passing during a meeting and I, I said that I had met with him, but I would rather not go over every detail of my discussion, especially since uh, we have a board member, uh, yourself in particular, uh, filing some kind of ethics questions. I, I'm, I'm not sure why I, would, why I would choose to discuss this during our public. Oh, that, but that the ethics board said it wasn't under their jurisdiction and they encouraged me to reach out to the um, to Mr. Marini, which I did, but he never answered me. So that's why I'm asking you, what did he say in general about that I, issue? I feel like you're coming to the wrong person, Vera. And I, I would ask Marissa to uh, 
provide some relief in this area. I don't yeah. think she knows, I, right? Well, I actually, think. no, I think you have to wait for Mr. Marini to respond back to you. And then that will be where you get the information that you're looking for. Yeah. Just to, be able to provide you that information because Mr. Marini has not specifically given him his final resolution. He just said that it'll be forthcoming. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And I think that's something that also, I think I would like to see once again um, for our working group to have as a guidepost, which is our code of ethics, just the uh, 10 basic rules of our codes of ethics. And some of them are pertinent to us being successful and being able to work as a group of upholding all laws, educational welfare, limited to policy making. This is a key one. No micromanaging, no personal promises, private action. Six is no personal gain. Seven, maintain confidentiality. Consider CSA recommendations. Nine is support personnel. And 10 is proceed through proper channels. So if we can, this is once again, what I'd like to see adapted for our work group as a, a coda. So that we're all on the same page. And there's one other thing while we're on this diversion in a way is to have this. So every board member has this, which is the special education process from top to bottom, so they can see how it works and understand how it works. So those are things I would like to see to make it a, a productive working group and have guidelines around us that we can refocus upon if we get a drift before we get a drift. So I, I don't know, Marissa, how, you, how or when you wanna address that or how we wanna as a group I think that it would be best if if you forward those documents to myself and Joe, we'll review them and then we can pass them to the full board so that yeah. everybody has a copy of that. I think that's a, a great tool for us all to have yeah. in our toolbox I, to utilize moving forward. Uh, thank you. I think that would give us a framework that's concise and we can move forward with accomplishing stuff. So I'll get that to you guys. Okay, so, thank you. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, if there is no further discussion to be had in regards to the superintendent's report, uh, we will move forward to operations and facilities. And I believe that um, if you look in your in your docs, you'll see that there's a, a document there for the month of July and what was done at the schools. If there's no questions about that operations and facilities committee report, we'll move on to policy and there was not a policy report provided. I didn't know if anybody had anything that they wanted to bring up at this point in time to add to the agenda. Uh, possibly just what I was talking about of, of making this our working policy mm -hmm. within the group. So that that's our policy in the working group. So I think that's, right. and Vera, you're, I know I'm on the committee, but Vera, you're the chairperson. Um, Does that make sense to you? Yeah, well, that makes sense. And the, the other thing is that um, we want to take a limit off of who can connect to the meeting remotely. Um, I think executive, I'm not sure that um, if is the um, Parker McKay lawyer still with us? Yes, yes, I'm on the line. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Guerin, uh, I wanted to ask you, is there any regulation stating that there that um, for an executive meeting, uh, a person cannot connect remotely. I'm thinking of a case where someone is feeling sick. They don't, they don't wanna take a chance in coming to the executive meeting, but it's not so bad. They can still participate. They would rather participate remotely from home. Uh, can they do that or could you so the open me? public the open public meeting act doesn't really speak to it um what it says uh, for school districts 
Um, if you want to have somebody dialing in, typically you need to have a policy that allows them to dial in. But these rules and regulations were written in the time of conference calls and pagers, not really for the technology you have now. The fact is that the board can adopt a policy or suspend existing policy in extraordinary circumstances to allow people to attend remotely or via Zoom or however you see fit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, as the poli uh, well, I'm not really a policy chair, I guess, because we're doing this all together, but I recommend that um, there be no limit on uh, whoever needs, feels they need to uh, connect remotely, either to a regular meeting or an executive meeting, because I don't want somebody coming if they're feeling nauseous or even a little bit, or if they have a little headache be on the safe side, connect remotely. Can we all agree to take off those limits? Would you say that due to illness? Would you um, want to thought out? Yeah, because otherwise I'd... Just, just to, to make it a little more clear, it's just how I act as a teacher. Um, in the past okay. school year, when I had a super bad headache, and I would have never taken off a day of work for like a bad headache. You, I would just go in. But now because of, you know, the era of COVID, I err, err on the side of caution. And I, you know, when we were in person during that time, I just did not go into work. As a board member, if I had a really bad headache and I could still function, but I don't want to go in person. I don't want to take a risk. I want to connect remotely. Like you said, it's, it's something where you're, you're feeling a little bit under the weather, but you still want to connect. So I... Would we, can we all agree that we allow that without limit, without limiting it to just two people or whatever? I'm in favor Be, of making Before we agree, can we get other people's opinions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm in favor of, of making that change. Um, I mean, it's we've been we've been violating that policy. You know, since no, no, no. We so, changed the policy. We changed the policy. Exact, we changed it when we went into remote. Mm -hmm. right. We had to change it. It was changed. Correct. Am change I correct, it. Joe? You're Marissa? correct. You're correct. Gotcha. So uh, going, going forward, even if we're so in person, there were some so policy changes, but we were just following public law that said that we were yes. required to allow uh, board members to be virtual as well as the audience and so on and so forth. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but the policy itself, itself still limits it to two people. Yeah, and you so have and to and only to two times, I think. And you have to separate out the regular board meetings from executive board, executive board. But that's you, not by sta state regulation. I think Ms. Garen uh, that we make No, our executive own board. Well, I'm just going to refer Ms. back Garen, to code of you... ethics, back to the code of ethics, and. Um, Ms. Garen, I think you just said that that was left up to the individual school districts. Is that correct? Yes. The, um, I don't know. I don't recall off the top of my head exactly what the Open Public Meeting Act says about executive session, but in it certainly during the time of COVID, um, the rules are such that you can participate by Zoom. That was um, decided at a state level back when the pandemic started. And that has not been rescinded, correct? As far as I know. Okay. Yeah, so, because so like us, are, other schools are, are doing remote. We're doing so things when remotely. When we go back to I, in person meetings, an unlimited amount of people could also connect remotely. Is that is everyone in agreement? I agree. I'm not sure if I'm totally in agreement and I'm the only reason why is because like last month we had an issue um, where I guess there was a discrepancy in how for the privacy and confidential confidentiality aspect of executive session there was a member that um, opted to have family present at one point in time and I think that's a huge and grave concern especially when we're dealing with confidential matters um I would prefer to have executive session in person. I think it's really important to hold that level of confidentiality in the highest regard. Uh, like I'm sure that those that we're speaking about or talking about or things of that nature would also want that confidentiality held in the highest regard. 
And it is difficult to determine and to put that faith, honestly, you know, across the board when we are unsure truly what's going on in the background. We only see a snippet, a tiny little square of, you know, what's going on. I, that's just my my concern only because of past practice of what's I, occurred. I really, um, I really agree with that. That's, I, that's I mean, my, that's your personal opinion. And I appreciate that. Like, okay. my personal opinion. And sure. once in an the executive session and we handled it immediately, you know, it was not a long running problem. The, the that we know of, of, that we know of, Steve. Also, yes, we, can we, can, require, we, can we can require that people have headphones on. Like I always use headphones for in-person and executive. With these headphones on, nobody in my house can hear what's going on. That could be part of board policy. We do have to put a certain amount of- And how is it? Our, how is it? Uh, you know, um, look, only you are going to know, Vera. But my I mean, my face will be on screen during. Vera, Vera, but okay. It's, here, it's, I'm just coming it's from here. Barely ever. We on don't screen. need to meet exceptionalities for individual people, and it's not, not just because in executive, of you here. We see maybe your forehead. Executive. That's oh what we separate. Guys, I'm you just are, saying you oh, can't say that you want to put your whole face on there when you don't. <laughs> I mean, we've been having executive. You don't have to see it now, Vera. Over a year. What the, the net effect of this is just going to be if whoever, whichever individuals don't feel comfortable meeting in person will be excluded from executive session. They'll be that's Probably what happens. That you can't have a you have to have a quorum in executive. Quorum. I didn't go to executive <laughs> sessions early on. I there were I didn't go. Other people went. I did there not go. No because, there's no good reason for that. What's that? But there was no good reason for that in, in, in my opinion. You should other than that the rules that we were following. Where the rules so there's no good reason the for the rules. rules. We set the rules. This is what I don't understand. We should have a we, certain we amount of trust. We set the rules within the context of the organization that we work under and the guidelines of the state of New Jersey. We don't. No, we set create. the rules based on our own best judgment. Yes. Right? Really. Yeah, and then we can have nine people, everyone using their own best judgment. That's kind of how we're what well, we're we trying to avoid. We're trying to get nine people to agree on something. And the maintaining confidentiality has been a problem. And to, you know, I didn't go to the meeting. That was, yeah, if I, if it meant that I had to go to the meeting, I chose not to. Everyone can make individual choices. It's ridiculous. I don't and think I understand. There have, any, there have been no breaches of confidentiality that I know of. Does somebody know of one? I don't know of one. If there's uh, no Vera, I, Vera we, I don't know about anything else. I want to stay on topic tonight and I want to stay in the present. I don't want to go well, backwards and I don't want to go on it because this is policy here. and I know I'll probably Steve and I will probably lose a vote but at least well, we, we can't have record. we can't have random board members calling for votes either we have a presiding officer and we have a vice president so okay would the, they like to do that, that for, it, for the board to be discussing policy and procedure this way I think it really is up to Marissa to dis, to guide the discussion and determine voting and collecting ideas and I'm just wondering why that you know, there's another board member doing that when that person is emphasizing the need for clear policies that we should follow. Well, th this is a transition with the committee of the whole, and we we did have subcommittees where it was a little well, different. So, the Marissa, subcommittees would you like no to longer leave? exist, and we have a presiding officer who has stated her opinion, and it's my job to advise the board, and I'm advising the board that that we have a president and a vice president who, who basically run the meeting, not other board members. Okay, so, I'm going to I'm going I'm a, to I'm a little uh, that. I'm a little concerned that we're talking about policy changes and we have um, we I'm have I'm going a, to acknowledge that and ask Marissa of a meeting. if she would like to call for a vote or not since that's her role. Marissa, well, would and you that's like to do that's that? the point. That's what I'm making and Harry's been making that point is that we have procedures in place already that I don't think we should ignore and Marissa as the president is the one that, so it, either way I'm just I'm just saying this to guide the board through this process that there is no policy chair anymore there is no policy committee anymore so and it, this is Amy I just want to weigh in I want to echo some of what Joe is saying and I also want to add that you have to decide what your process is going to be you just don't say I want a policy tonight let's vote on it there's the policy development process you have ideas you come up with proposals you discuss them 
your board chairperson should be mediating that discussion. It's not a free for all. And then when you have some sort of idea of what direction you're going, your board charges your administration with drafting a policy that everyone reviews and it gets placed on the agenda in due course. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't want to stifle the discussion. The discussion is legitimate. You're asking legitimate policy questions, but in terms of the process, you don't write a policy on the fly. You know, it's something you develop and it gets placed on the agenda in due course. And, and this subject is, is not on your agenda. Correct. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, the and it isn't an urgent problem. We can address it as part of the work group as an issue, but why? You know, I'm saying this is we have because we haven't things. been first for over a year. Huh? Well, I've been on well, the like, board. I have an unvaccinated child. You know what I mean? I, so I, 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 I'm like one of the ones who's not going to be in person at the meetings. And, so, and I can uh, and I can appreciate that as well. I can appreciate that. Um, but sometimes I think that we're making these decisions not because. And, and this is just my personal opinion because I see people out in the community because we live in such a small community and I can see how people walk about town and here and there. Sometimes I think the decision to be remote at home could be a personal preference outside of the vaccination aspect. I don't see the problem with that either. What's that? I don't see the problem with that either. No, it's hard to see other people's problems sometimes. Because also what I would, what I'm hoping for is that. So yes. So also what I'm hoping for is that when we go back to the in-person voting meetings, because our kids will be present during that time, all children in the school, once we start that process, it is important to have our full board present to the best of our ability to support not only the agenda and the voting of what's on the agenda, but also to support the children that it will be receiving their recognition that evening. So I just want to keep that aspect also open and understood. And then as well, I would like that opportunity to discuss anything that's relevant in an executive session to be discussed at that point in time while we're in person. So Marissa, just, just a question for you as the president, because I want, and this is an honest to God question. Are we on the discussion item under old business remote participation during in-person board meetings? Or are we on policy which has no report because i feel like i correct I don't wanna... the policy has no report all right this is a procedural I had thing asked that if i'm it, asking right and i had asked if anybody wanted to bring anything up to discuss under the policy Sorry. since that would is one of the policies that we have currently yes. and right. we discussed at the last meeting that this is something we may want to bring up in regards to yeah. minimizing how many can dial in in the event of an illness mm -hmm. um, i think that's why i i, I specified that i'm not opposed yeah to having the dial in, but you're right. I mean, it's under the old business aspect of what we discussed well, previously. Yeah, that, that's why I was asking, because not that we can't focus on it during policy, because originally when Steve and I were talking about it, we were going to place it in that area. But then we thought it's it's probably not going to be on the actual agenda for August 18th, rather be on the agenda for tonight as a discussion item. We put mm -hmm. it old business. It was just something that we were, because I know we're still looking at the draft agenda, but the draft agenda itself is probably not going to include a sudden policy change one week from now. Uh, I, that is correct. That's why I was talking about procedure and voting on things tonight and all that, just like Amy is saying that I do think it's going to take a little bit of time to really clarify all of this, because it sounds like there's disagreement among the board. That's a natural process, but I feel like if there's a policy that's going to be developed and I'm or, and I'm given the, the marching orders to develop a policy, I guess the question is, what's it going to look like? Because there, there could be four board members that say, we don't want that policy verbally, and then five say that they do. And so I feel like we're, we are kind of um, just kind of in that discussion right now. We're not necessarily in the process of writing the policy, uh, approving the policy, you know, more of just discussing ideas, right? Right. And so I, what I think how we can handle this moving forward is that if a, an item comes up after under a specific agenda item, like mm -hmm. policy, we can say, does this topic relate to anything we've discussed previously, old business, 
Or is this something that can be addressed as new business that we can discuss and implement and plan for moving forward? So I think that that's a good point to bring up that we don't get stuck under the policy because obviously we're not discussing anything specific that's on the agenda policy related, but we can certainly say this is a policy item that we can discuss under old business related to blah, blah, blah. I think that that's an acceptable way to handle that moving forward. And I, I'm fine with instituting that process. All right. And that's why the reason I was asking is because we've never done this before, where we're basically working off of two agendas. We have tonight's agenda and then next week's agenda, which is the agenda where things are being actually being up for approval, you know? So I feel like that's the, that's the kind of cause for maybe a little things getting a little mixed up right now, but it's all part of the process of, of transitioning to committee of the whole. And Absolutely. isn't it when something is pat new is passed, there's a first reading of it and a second reading of it normally. Correct. There is. And there Steve, is. Steve, um, I agree with you, which you don't realize that because I was I was against when that was put in there limiting, but someone wanted it and I went along with it. That's why it's in there. I, I agree with your point of view. And I also think that the executive session has to be thought of as different than the regular board meeting that so it's just getting to it and there's not an urgency that there is to whether or not we have teachers and nurses and you know happy kids coming into school and everyone's uh, doing yeah. their best again yeah i'm really frustrated i don't i don't think there's a big problem we should be able to get a first reading at the next meeting because it's a tiny tweak it's, right now there's a limit of two members participating remotely in executive we should say no limit you know which would be changing one sentence We've done that. We've done first reading and adoption and we, you know, we suspend the requirement of a certain bylaw and say first reading and adoption. And we had, and I know Amy's here now, but we had Susan Hodges talk to us about that process a number of years ago. Uh, uh, so it is a possibility. I'm, I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying that I don't know that the board right now is ready to rush into saying, let's change that policy. Right. right. It's, it's the board president's decision. So we, let's just move yeah. on. Right, so I, we can discuss this a little bit more in old business, and that way we can just get through the, this, the personnel aspect of the agenda, and then the liaison part, and then we'll go back to old and new business, and we can discuss a little bit further um, to see what everybody's point of view is, because we've only heard like three individuals' point of view. So it's important to find out what the entire board feels. Okay, so, um, but I do appreciate that, and I respect your opinion, so we will listen and talk about it further. Um, so we'll move to personnel. Does anybody have any questions regarding what is on the agenda at this point in time, including the highlighted as ideas of I, J, K, and L? Did we see that email that came across that had that information as to who those individuals were, or did you look in the Google Doc to see the staff as assignments? And are we correct that uh, yellow are just current employees that have been moved to a different position? Yes. And that, that's uh, correct. And the brown are new employees, and the red are open or expected open positions. Correct. Yeah, it's an, it looks orange for some, maybe yeah. brown for yeah. others. Yeah, I was going to say orange, but yes, that, that is accurate. And that okay. in itself is actually going to find its way onto the agenda for August 18th as well, uh, because the board typically approves that document for certified assignments. It's just we had assignments set up about a month and a half ago. And then assignments currently, they, they've changed. The ones in yellow were already in place. It's just kind of, I'm just saying that so that the board understands we've had some transitions. But the ones in orange are brand new. And so the, those are the ones that, uh, you know, haven't even, it, we, the board hasn't approved their assignment on that list yet. The board has approved them, uh, for most of them to be hired. So just, just so everyone's aware, if we look at the personnel list right now, uh, we do see Stacy Spatzier Onorado on there as a special ed teacher, Rebecca Healy as a special ed teacher, and then we also, um, where it says hiring of substitute caller, uh, I did select someone for that, which uh, we're meeting with her and going through the process with her. Uh, she will be on the board agenda for the 18th. Steve and I are revising this agenda so that the board has a fresh one for the 18th. This is the, dr this is the draft. And then also, um, we had our, our wonderful new principals, Barry Sade and John Caracasian, 
uh, meeting with candidates and selecting a part-time counselor and part-time art teacher now. So we, we will have those names too. It's the hiring of a school nurse, which uh, right now we're still working on. Uh, are there candidates? Yes, there are candidates and interviews that are being set up and uh, John Caracasian is leading the way on that one. And it was nice seeing the principals at the uh, Enviro. I, I, I think I saw you through my foggy glasses there uh, at the um, that the PTO sponsored of Meet the Principals and the ice cream in the rain in the mist. It was neat. It was a neat experience. And it looks like good rapport from the principals with the community and vice versa. So that's that's a great start. They're wonderful principals already. And, and I can't be happier. They started on July 26th. The board had approved that. They're doing an amazing job. Excellent. Does anybody else have any more uh, information or discussion points that they want to bring up in regards to letters A through L prior to next week's meeting? It's the time. All right, I will take that as a no. Board liaison reports. Mr. Cameron will speak about Riverside. Mr. Litwack will continue to speak about New Jersey School Boards and Burlington County School Board Association. And Mrs. Tersha Keeley will continue to speak about the Township Committee. Was there anything important that you guys wanted to bring up in regards to the specific reports at this point in time? Uh, from the, Cameron, you wanna go? Yeah, I'll just speak real briefly. Yeah. Nothing. I mean, uh, yeah, nothing, you go. You're, that's how the schedule. Yeah. Uh, nothing real crazy. Riverside was supposed to have our meeting 6.30 tomorrow night. Jesus, it's already Wednesday and tomorrow's Thursday. Um, was supposed to have our meeting. I don't expect it to be anything too crazy. Uh, so I'll report on it uh, next Wednesday. Yeah. Okay, Harry? Yes. Um, the County School Boards Association, we had on the 15th, it was a planning uh, meeting with the county officers of next year. And the topics that we were looking at are diversity, equity, uh, SEL for staff and students. That's the other thing we have to remember ourselves as well. Everyone's gone through a very uh, different year and a half. So it's important to understand that. Social media, staff anxiety, uh, foundation and contemporary issues, legal updates, regionalization, uh, public comment policy, and then uh, people wanted to stay away from some of the more controversial topics of masks and uh, CRT, et cetera. And so next year for anyone who wants to uh, attend any of the, the county things in it, gatherings and they will probably they're intended to be hybrid but we'll see what happens with that but anyway they're mostly on Thursdays September 23rd is going to be the SEL and a new topic December 14th it'll be the foundations that's kind of it, it's somewhat mandated to get that that'll be where people will be able to uh, also I believe take any of the trainings they need. February 17th is diversity. Then the only one that switches to a Tuesday is in March, which is the eighth grade dialogue. I don't know if anyone's been able to look at any of the eighth grade dialogue that were done as video, but it's really kind of interesting to hear not only uh, students' opinions, but eighth grade enlightened uh, people that have had their own experience and explaining what's going on. So that's, it will be interesting. And then um, social media will be the end of the year. And that, that is it. There was a meeting on Monday, but it was hard, it was hard to impossible to get into it. So I really don't have anything to report. And apparently I, I wasn't the only one <laughs> that, that, that had trouble getting it. So thank you. And You're welcome. Thank, thank you. 
Okay, Mr. Keeley, do you have anything to report in regards to the township, excuse me, township committee? So is the idea to move our reports to the work session? Just to go over them in case anybody has any questions about them specifically, they'll be revisited again at the meeting, but this is for people during the work session to discuss if there's anything that's relevant to bring up and then we can discuss it if it's new business or things that we need to address in the next two uh, sections. Do we... Just I guess I'm curious if we should move it to the work session instead then, because I'm, I guess I'm curious if it's on the the voting session, is part of it a public good that we're having this conversation in front of the public or is at it times, something Yes, just, at, at times I think it is important that, for instance, you know, Cameron attends the Riverside Board of Ed meeting and while the information is important to us to hear as well that the community in the event that they come during the voting session could hear it as well. It gives two opportunities for people that may, maybe couldn't make it tonight to hear it mm -hmm. next week. That's just my personal opinion. If the board sees that it should be done differently, we can have a discussion on that in regards to how to handle the board liaison reports. We can we can speak about that in like a, a new business type of thing, um, but or we could speak about it now. I, I'm not sure how people want to hear it. I, I think Harry would like I mean, it seems as though the community is dialing in tonight, which is awesome. But um, also when we have our voting meetings, I think in the event that somebody stays, for those, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, that they can hear those uh, important things as well, especially if it pertains to the township committee and they weren't able to make it to that or the Riverside, you know, uh, going ons and of course, New Jersey School Board and Bronson County School Board in case there's something specific that a community member wants to get involved with. So is the, the idea then would be that we would give the report twice? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Gotcha. Okay. But we personally as board members would ask our questions related to those reports. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I actually couldn't attend the last township committee meeting, so I don't have any. <laughs> that's perfectly <laughs> fine. <laughs> really understandable. <laughs> um, but I will bring up, uh, I did get an email from Mr. Oh, Hamilton. sorry, that was my question for you. I meant to bring okay. that up. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, ahead. no, I did get an, an email from him referencing the Route 130. Um, I'm gonna look it up really quick. I just, I didn't wanna forget it. Um, here it is. Uh, we're, everything keeps coming through. The Route 130 Citizens Advisory Committee Assessment Review. Um, they've provided, they've, provided us with who the committee members are. Um, it's Mike Templeton, myself, Linda Gaffney, Dan Martin, Chris Kloss, Tom Finan, and Peter Fritz. Those were the uh, members um, that will be part of the regional plan endorsement by in, with 12 different participating municipalities. So we're all going to get together um, and work with other municipalities to find assistance in and funding opportunities at the state level for all of our community, all of our communities. Okay. So um, that is something new and that was received on Monday. So I just wanted to provide that update. Um, not that it's, I'm sure he probably would have mentioned it at the meeting, perhaps, I don't know, to be quite honest. What, I know what other the, communities, what, what mm -hmm. other 130 communities are involved? Let's see, well, I'm gonna tell you. I gotta open I'll open up this document really quick and yeah. take there's 11 neighboring communities that are addressed. Hold your horses, let's see. City of Beverly, City of Burlington, Burlington Township, Cinnaminson Township, Delango, Delran Township, Edgewood Park, Lawrence, Borough of Palmara, uh, Riverside, Riverton, and Willingboro. Excellent. Excellent. That's that the great. That's what needs to be done. And it's glad to see that's going on again. Yeah, so I think um, also they were uh, supposed to be sending out an email to you about a board of ed member joining the uh, marijuana business or cannabis business. I did. Um, see, I, I don't know if it was asked for someone, but I saw an email it, like that was informational in regards that they were hoping to to start to bring that up. I don't know if they were going to bring it up tonight when we speak about public comment on non-agenda items, but you're right. I do remember seeing something and let me just scroll back down a little bit further. Yeah, I had requested that they include the Board of Ed because the tax dollars that the township would collect from cannabis revenue would have a big impact on us, so. Um, Absolutely, I, I, I agree. I, I know I did see that, I, that's gonna drive me nuts.
I'm trying to see how far back. Uh, Okay, but yes, so what I can do is I will follow up on that. I'm gonna just, I was gonna try to search by his name, make it easier. Okay. Well, we can discuss this. I can look into this a little bit more so that we can table that and discuss that a little bit more. I, I wanna look at it. I don't wanna take up too much of people's time to now, right now doing that. But I, however, I do remember an email coming across, but I didn't remember it asking for specifics, but it probably was a generalized email saying, we're going to be doing this moving forward, but I can confirm that. And what I will do is that I'll look at that tonight and then I'll send that information to, to Joe and ask him to share it with the board. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, old business. So, okay. Was there anything else? I'm sorry. I don't want to rush anybody. Was there anybody else that wanted to speak about any of those three subjects? Um, I have a question. When are we going to discuss budget and finance? So we can discuss I'm looking that. At the I'm speak looking about at that in new uh, business because it's not specific to the agenda right now. We were, we were going over the draft of the agenda and we were going in order. And after the superintendent's report, there was the instruction and program after that was budget and finance. So we were going like in order over the draft agenda and then we stopped. So I have some questions. You're right, about you're right, you're right, yeah, you're, right, you're right. right. That's my mistake. Steven. Stephen gave a pretty extensive budget and finance presentation, but I, I do understand that there might be other. Yes, I have some questions. Now, Can I ask them right now? Hold on. Give me one second. I want to go up to instruction and program. So I'll follow the agenda. That's my fault because I printed things on both sides trying to save a tree, and I just kept on going. So that's my mistake. So we spoke about the superintendent's report, and I'm sorry, we'll move back to instruction and program. Confidential classifications and placements, Exhibit G. Did anybody have any comments that they wanted to discuss in regards to that confidential aspect of the agenda? I just have one question. I'm not releasing any confidential information. When a student moves out of district, are we still responsible for their educational costs? Because I thought I saw something on there that led me to believe that, that they had moved out, but we, they were still listed. So uh, Vera, to answer your question, the way that that spreadsheet is set up is there's a column that says, you know, whether or not the student is still in the district and, and that column indicates, or it, there's a column that indicates that they've left the district. So when we were first doing this years ago, that, that list was talking about any new placements uh, who were newly arrived and registered, but also students who had left. So that student left and we are no longer responsible financially for that. Student. Okay, that was my only question on that item on that um, topic. Awesome, thank you. We'll move on to budget and finance. Does anybody have any questions for items A through B? I have a question on item A. It's on. It's in the public packet. It's Exhibit H, and um, it's payroll. I'm assuming that it, it's uh, it's saying retro, and then I, I see some figures that are very low level figures like $400. Then I see some figures that are like 22,000, 18,000. I'm guessing that it has to do with retroactive pay because of the new contract. Is that correct? Sorry, I was looking at it and I couldn't get back to the I'll meet myself. Yes, it's correct. The, uh, and, the, and the reason why you're seeing such small amounts for the retro is because, as I mentioned on one of the other um, emails from a while ago, we, I was able to process it because we didn't close out the year yet. And it was, a, it was a, an expenditure from last year's budget technically, even though it was completed in July. I was able to process it as a payable, meaning a bill from last year's budget 
even though it's processed in July. But to do that, it's a manual posting of it. And that's why you're seeing several smaller chunks, as you mentioned. Okay, and then the bigger chunks are just people at a higher pay scale, they got a, a big bump in pay. So that's their retroactive pay is therefore higher on that. It rate. could be, it's based on account numbers because it's manually posted, it's based on account numbers. So oh, for okay. example, if I take the 11, 120 account, which is all the uh, elementary school teachers, it's gonna be a lot higher than the 11, 000, 213 account, which incorporates one secretary. But those are individual retroactive payouts, right? That's those things that I see listed, that's not a group when it's 22 It could be, for it goes by person. budgetary account. It goes by budgetary account, that's how it's posted. Okay, so I'm incorrect in thinking it's one person who got a 22K bump. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, yeah, I wanted absolutely. to be clear. No, okay, I sorry, thank I got you. you. Thank yeah, you. I understand that, gotcha. Awesome, anybody else have any questions for any of the items? Under budget and finance? I had a question oh, about letter P. Mm -hmm. um, which is about um, shared services agreements. I just, uh, I couldn't immediately find our previous list of those. I just was curious if any of those were new shared services agreements or if they're all just renewals. One second, I'm, I'm getting there. They're all, they're all the old ones. Yeah, they're all what we've been doing before. And they're actually cooperative purchasing agreements. Uh, shared mm -hmm. service is different. These are oh, sorry, I meant to yeah, I meant to say cooperative purchasing. Sorry. So yeah, and these are these are the staples of most districts here. I mean, we're using. I'm looking at them right now. The Camden County ones, Hunterdon County one. You have New Jersey ESC. They're the, they're the ones you generally are probably using the most out of any of them. And of course, that data. Um, now they're, they're the staples for most districts around this area. Thank you. I have one last question on budget and finance. It's letter L. Um, and I was speaking to Mr. Burns a little bit about this, but um, he did give me an answer. But I'm just wondering for that corrective action plan. Um, I didn't really understand the wording about the 14,000 and the 15,000. Where do you think the, the snag was in that? What, where was the mistake there, do you think? I don't even want to say it was a mistake. It was just the way the report was coming out. Like the, the numbers were accounted for. It's just the report didn't have it, didn't have what they were looking for on it. Um, so I wouldn't say it's a mistake. It's like me saying, it's like, it's like saying, give me a report for this. And they're giving something which isn't exactly what they were, they were wanting if they wanted. I would say it's more like that. Um, well, it every, said that, that the um, school food authority has to reconcile the amount of USDA of commodities accepted to the value of commodities utilized. So they're saying that the amounts should be matching. Is that what yeah. they mean? Again, the report's not spitting out. Yeah, exactly. They, they do match. I'm telling you, NutriServe, I've had this before in another district, and they've had to address it across the whole entire company. The way the report printed it wasn't matching, as you mentioned. But all they had to do was fix the way the report was coming out. Their data in their, their their data in their files is fine, so they're they're now adjusting their report to simply contain that information, and therefore the corrective action plan will be very very simple, and that is just simply uh, they fix the report and we can just, we can then just say it like you mentioned the numbers will be on there that we can say. It. Okay, thank you, Mr. Burns. Yeah, so it's, it's, those are uh, all my questions. Yeah, no, it's 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 I understand the confusion with that one because it, honestly, it's those reports from food service are, are complicated. But um, I, I have to stress, it really is, it's, it's something which I pretty much, I think every, <laughs> from what I know is most issues have received that report and it's just simply nothing more than a reporting, the way it's reported, not so much an error in the way they were doing it. If that makes okay. sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? So Marissa, I have a question. Since this is the work session, I think I just wanna kind of pose a question to the board and uh, to Vera in particular. So Vera, I, I, I believe you know how to speak Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. I, I have upper intermediate ability. Okay, well, I'm only asking because it most likely took you many years to develop your skills in that area, correct? Yes. So the reason I'm saying this is that, you know, I, I don't speak that language, but what would happen is 
if I were given certain words or characters and I talked to you and said, Vera, could you explain what that is? I'm going to understand something that you're showing me, but I'm not going to understand the big picture yet. And the same thing would be true if you showed me a sentence in Mandarin and I understood how to read it and then I could speak it and so on. And I feel like it's, it's a similar process where the business administrator has a highly specific set of training that he or she has gone through where, um, you know, Stephen, Vicky before him, James and Joanne, the four BAs that we Blanco, and they've all been very specifically trained when it comes to finances, budgeting, accounting, et cetera. And I just want the board to understand that when you ask a question about a certain finance related topic, it's kind of like me asking Vera, what's this sentence say in Mandarin Chinese? I'm going to understand a little bit, but I'm not going to understand the language yet. And I'm not going to understand the big picture. I'm not going to understand the culture yet. And I feel like that's, that's what happens sometimes that a lot of this, the budgetary information to board members or 99% or of the members of the community, it's probably arcane. You know, it just, it, it feels confusing. It feels completely unnatural for you. And it's, it's something that you're not used to. And that's why I feel like sometimes, you know, when, when we're discussing budgetary items, I, I do think it, it is important to ask questions, but also understand that the answers to those questions us, you know, sometimes show you this much and, and don't show you the whole picture. So I yes, just um, I wanted to emphasize to the board that uh, it takes years to truly understand what Stephen and other business administrators do. Just, just to, a, a quick comment with the language analogy and also for the public, the only way you get better in speaking a foreign language is to make lots of mistakes, not be afraid to make mistakes and keep talking. So even though it's a very big challenge to learn a foreign language or the language of the school board, I encourage everyone to not be afraid of making mistakes and just keep asking questions and learning. That's all I wanted to say. I, I agree with you completely, Vera. I'm just making the point to the board since this is the discussion, the workshop session that it, it, if a board member has been on the board for years and years, like Marissa and Harry have been, or Phil, who's not here tonight, even those board members have taken many years absorbing all this information. They couldn't do Stephen's job. They couldn't do 10% of Stephen's job. You know, and that's, and that's the thing that even years and years of being on a board, you may or may not fully understand what's happening when it comes to the accounting and budgeting and all of the financial skills that are necessary for that. So that's why I just want to emphasize to the board that uh, you will understand bits and pieces, absolutely. But sometimes the, the bigger picture will be more difficult to understand. Um, and Joe, just I'm to like piggyback on that, as you can tell for me, I do try to share with you and educate you on, on different things. So I want you to understand my world as much as possible. So I, I, I thank you. Thanks for that, Joe. And I will always make the attempt to try to explain things as best as possible. We appreciate that, thank you. Okay. Is there anything else that anybody wants to discuss under budget and finance? If not, then I will jump back to where I was previously in old business since I made that mistake. And I would, I would just like while. to thank Stephen again for his efforts is creative, uh, rising to the creative challenges in a very sophisticated, subtle way. Thank you, Stephen. Agreed. Thanks, Stephen. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. So back to old business, uh, where we want to discuss attendance and how we would attend meetings, whether they be uh, workshop sessions and or well, so Marissa, sessions. Yeah. And originally we did. Mm -hmm. I could interrupt for one minute. So what, what you're looking at on the 18th is that old business and new business is there for the sake of when we're there on the 18th, is there any old or new business that we need to discuss at that time, right? right. Because we have an, now an August 11th agenda with old business and new business as well. And like I said, I feel like we were kind of muddling the mixture a little bit uh, 
throughout the meeting, but it's also because we've never done this type of meeting before. Right. So my thought is that whatever we discuss is old business, if it's relevant to move forward onto the agenda, we would put it under old business. And again, mm -hmm. something new that's not on the agenda or that we haven't spoken about previously, then it would go under new business. And we, and if it's pertinent, we would speak about it on, you know, if necessary during the 18th. So with that being said, if I'm understanding clearly, since we did discuss the attendance previously, this would fall under old business. We want to have a bit more clarity on the policy of how we want to handle our virtual versus in-person aspect. We previously discussed that workshop sessions would truly be virtual and that our voting sessions would be in-person so that we could have that compromise across the those are things we did discuss previously. Now we're looking to have a bit more clarification on the policy that's existing in regards to what happens if somebody is ill. What if somebody is unable to make it to that in-person voting session? So now we need to discuss that because I think that's something that the board wanted to discuss a little bit more at length. Yeah. We wanted to gain the opinions of those present board member wise and then decide how we would like to proceed forward in regards to that, whether we just dismiss this and not discuss it any further, or we truly have to speak about it in old business moving forward in our next meeting as maybe a possible first reading or things or put under the policy committee notation or something of that nature. So that's my understanding of what we have to do. I, I think you're correct. And if I'm not mistaken, um, it needs to be changed to, for whatever it says. For some reason, someone on the committee at that point insisted that it was only going to be, I think, one person at a time or two people, whatever's in there. Two people. Which I didn't understand, and I didn't understand because if the need's there, the need's there. It should be based on need. The, the, what people were trying to get around was, oh, well, I don't have to be at the meeting. I can just you know, I can get on the board and never have to come to meetings, never have to, do, you know, but that's, you know, was different times. It was pre-COVID, but I didn't, you know, it just didn't seem to make sense to limit it. It was like having to ask permission, you know, may I, and how would you know if you, it was primarily like this, if someone was going on vacation, couldn't be there. But for those of us who have been here long enough, know that we had a president that wasn't in the community for a long while and we were doing things, you know, electronically that were less uh, fluid than all of this. So it, there was a point to it, but I think if, uh, I think, what, what do we need? We need five people for a quorum, right? We do. And we put something in that we need five people physically for a quorum and, and just letting someone know. I, I, it's a difference between getting a last minute headache and not showing up and knowing you're not gonna be there because you're gonna be on vacation, but you wanna be part of the, you know, the, the, the discussion. Or yeah, you have a child and we, you know, I can't do that at that time. Or, you know, for Bob, if he's working, whatever it is, the idea is to be accommodating to the board in a way that reflects what the, the, the needs are. So maybe Steve, you probably, it seems like you've thought about this quite a bit. What do you, what do you think? I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you, Harry. I, I don't see, I mean, I would say first, first of all, we, I, yeah, they, we, I, we, we should not have any limit on the number of remote participants in an executive session, in my opinion. Um, Can we keep those issues separate? Right, so we're let's address, we address the other one first. Right, we'll just, discuss voting session first, and then we'll speak yeah. about the session. So voting session will be discussed first. Right. So when we have yeah, our second that. meeting of the month, please hold. When we have our second meeting of the month, we have agreed previously that we would be in person as opposed to virtual like this workshop. Mm -hmm. um, you would now like to bring up the point that in the event of an, you know, a, a, a matter outside of your control, you're unable to make it to that meeting. And you would like that limit to not be held over your head as to how many can participate virtually versus how many can participate in person. I'll let you speak on that now more. Uh, yes, I agree. I, I don't, 
I would say, first of all, I don't see the problem with keeping all remote because we, we don't have the technology in place to do a good hybrid meeting setup right now. And I, I contacted the, uh, Mr. Mersinger about this over a week ago and, and we, we haven't made the technical thing happen. So it seems like it's not gonna happen for next week. Um, so that's the first thing is I'm still opposed to meeting in person at all. But if we're gonna meet in person then we need to be accommodating to people who are on the fence, um, not just individuals who might be ill, but maybe individuals who are making a judgment call based on, um, I mean, COVID is still spreading. We, we may end up in a situation, you know, in an October meeting where uh, one of my, I saw a friend last week, we were, you know, in person masked. They come down with COVID. Now I think, you know, maybe I'm asymptomatic. I'm not feeling any symptoms, but it's just better for me to quarantine. You know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, thinking that, that's going to come up you know, in the next few months, potentially. So having a having an artificial limit on the number of people who can participate remotely seems like counterproductive to me. Well, well, we don't have that now because of that ruling, right? That it can, you know, we, we're all doing remote. So that's, and what we decided to go back physically, well, that's all with masks now. When we were talking, I think the last time people said, well, I'm going to wear, well, I'm not, I'm going to, it's you know all masks now, and who knows what will happen. So we want a a policy that's open ended enough to accommodate for what we're doing now, and yet at the same time broad enough so that if we have to change things, we change them, and it's, we don't have to go through a two or three month period of of this process, which I know has frustrated you to no end, Steve. <laughs> and it yeah. would frustrate me too if I would, you know, where you are. Because I say we agree on on that that the limit is not what's needed. So I did I did send a, a document to uh, the board president and uh, and uh, Mr. Mersinger, outlining two possible options for the, the technology we could use to to make a hybrid meeting work better. Um, mm -hmm. And the biggest thing is really getting a microphone on any every individual person. So that's nine board members plus. At the very least, the superintendent um, plus the uh, business administrator. So that's you know eleven mics plus one mic for a participant in the audience. So we're talking about twelve mics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I put forward a, a budget option. You know, I think we can make this happen for less than five hundred dollars, uh, or we can put in some more money and, and make have a more durable setup. Um, but I think it is, I think it is do doable. I would, you know, I think it might be worth. I think for, for the next meeting next week, it might be worth uh, meeting remotely simply because we don't have the technology in place to do a, an effective hybrid meeting. So for the so, sake of making public access, but that, that seems like the way to go for me. My question then I would pose to our board members are if we were to request funds to purchase this equipment, I would want as many board members in person to utilize that equipment so that we're not spending it for items not to be used. So if we're going to be purchasing as many microphones that you had mentioned, it would be truly beneficial if there are individuals in place to use them. Don't you agree? Well, Otherwise, the, 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 purchase, the, the purpose of getting the right equipment is that it gives us the flexibility to roll with the punches, keep our knees loose. So if we have you know, nine people in person plus some remote participants, if we have the right hardware in place, then we can and that's what the hardware accomplishes basically is that we, we can do a hybrid meeting because currently we can't really do a hybrid meeting because we can't but mic does it. it have to does it go right from the the mic because when we used mics before it was still pretty distorted what the the amp that we were running it through whatever yeah that's was right yeah, problematic so if i'm not mistaken and i think the city <laughs> is finally doing something with the town hall that has horrible acoustics as well right yeah and they're, they're dedicating more money to this than i think we are they're putting a few thousand dollars in getting them uh getting some new equipment but yes yeah, so what we would need is microphones a microphone for each person with a little table stand and then a mixer that can accommodate those um so we can go for lower end microphones with you know eighth inch plugs and a lower end mixer or we can put a little more money into a mixer and use XLR cables and, and uh, yeah, I think the mixer the mix is the more yeah. important. Yeah, but we have to, right. So then the, the mixer would go into the computer, and that way we can 
remote participants can hear and uh, remote participants can also ask questions. And right. can Albert, so my, I'm can sorry. Albert do no, that? Albert's not on. Albert's not on. I know, that's what I'm asking. We, we, we do have it's easy Albert's, to say that when Albert's not on. We, we <laughs> have his opinion, though, Marissa. Opinion. Steve yeah. and I spoke to him extensively about this. And Albert's opinion is that it's not going to be streamlined. It's going to be very messy. And uh, he, he believes that it will create a lot of issues. Now, I know that a point was made that teachers went through this last year doing hybrid instruction. My opinion of that is I, I understand that that's what happened last year. But when it comes to the board and proceeding with business, it's not the same thing with same thing as instructing children. So I feel like that we have to, we can't necessarily compare apples to oranges there. But what I would say is, I mean, Albert is the one that would implement it for us. So if the board says, Joe, carry it out, make it happen. We've already told Albert, Albert, whether you agree with this or not, we may need to do it. But he just believes that it's going to be messy. It's not going to be streamlined. And we're going to have issues where We've got members of the audience online like we have now, board members online like we have now, board members in person, audience members in person, and then there, there's no clear way for both groups to be part of the same meeting unless we talk about a pretty sophisticated sound setup and also a visual setup because if we're on a Zoom meeting right now and we have an audience in front of us over here, how do they see what's going on? You know, so. What if it, we're going to be projecting a, a video or not a video, but projecting an image of what's happening virtually as well uh, up against the wall. So, I mean, it is a pretty intricate setup. And we talked to Albert about this logistically. And it's, um, you know, we're, we're most likely going to be using our cafeteria and our gym for the after school program. So it's not as though Albert can just start at noon and set it up. I and mean, we're going to be using it for lunches and so on. But it's going to be a situation where the space that we have is, is not necessarily accommodating for setting up something like this as a hybrid. And again, we know teachers did it in their classrooms. I, I think that they are absolute saints and heroes for doing that. It's the most challenging thing that teachers have ever done to implement a hybrid program because when we were fully virtual, it was like this as teachers. When we were in person, that was, that was what teachers are used to in person. When you do it as hybrid, it, it increased the difficulty by a factor of 10. So that the same thing would happen to us as a board. So in some ways, Steve McLaughlin, I understand your point where you're saying, well, why be in person at all if we can streamline it and be fully virtual? Because that, that's something Albert also asked. He said, well, if you're going to have board members and the policy might change to allow any board members to do it, you might have me, Steve, Marissa, and... Bob in the room, and then everybody else is virtual, and then we are all asking ourselves, well, why do we have an in-person meeting? You know, so it's just a question. I'm not saying that that would happen, but there are some hypotheticals that come up where Albert is saying, it, Albert's asking the question, is it really worth it to go that hybrid route for the board meeting, or is it worth it to say virtual or in-person and streamline it one way or the other? That's just something he and Steve... Steve Burns and I discussed. Steve Burns, did you have anything else about what Albert said? No, I think he summed up pretty well. I think it's just, um, you know, we only, we only have so many hours in a day, and I think it's getting complicated quickly. Uh, so I think streamlining it is the way to go, whichever way that is. Um, as me and you discussed, we don't, it doesn't impact me and you. Um, whichever way you want to go, just try to keep it simple. Um, I know for Joe and myself, we're dealing with a lot of new staff. Uh, we have three out of four new administrators. We have two out of four central office people that are new. Um, those transitions take time. I think just keeping things simple right now is kind of pivotal for us. I think, I think that kind of just brought a little bit more. The right, hybrid, so. the hybrid element, I know, like I say, the school boards association and their budget and they've been on the technology and this was this i was on the first hybrid meeting and it it was kind of okay but they had trouble the second one like i say i couldn't get on other people couldn't get on um so 
you know, and do we, you know, is that a cost that we need now? Um, keeping it simple and focusing on what we need to accomplish seems pertinent to me. So it seems like one way or the other. Well, I mean, one of the biggest reasons, and I, I understand the concerns for sure about your, your health and the health of your family and safety of your family and things like that. That's super important and obviously important to keep in mind. But we also did want to remember that the student recognition happens during the voting session of our meetings. And we mentioned how important that is. And we even had members of the community and staff mention how important that is, that we were present and provided that recognition in person to those students for their hard work since they will be in class and will be you know doing their due diligence to go to school daily um it was my directive and we voted on it last meeting that we would do the voting session in person so that it fell in line with what we're asking of them which is to go in person as well um and that was the compromise as to why we did the workshop sessions virtually and the voting sessions in person. That was the um, compromise that we made as board members. I'm still holding stern with that decision as to how I would like things to proceed forward. I think it's important for us to have a voting session in person. I think that I understand the, uh, object, the idea that we cannot do a hybrid situation at this point in time because we don't have the technology to support that, um, hence why we said that we wanted to have fully in-person versus a hybrid model for any of those other options. We were talking about it in the previous meeting workshop. We could do hybrid, we could do this. We decided let's compromise. We'll make this meeting, which would ultimately be normally a longer meeting because it's a lot of items to be discussed on a in a virtual way. The voting session, which should be relatively quick, because we're legitimately voting on items already previously discussed and agreed upon should be quite quick. And we would do that in person and then give the opportunity to recognize students who receive their recognition in person. That is what we discussed in the previous meeting and voted on. That's truly what I'm still holding to. Um, and I did not really want to change that moving forward. Can I, can I just interject? Is it possible to, I mean, everything's in flux. We're getting, we're hearing new things. You know, our opinions are changing about the COVID situation week to week. I think we should just vote about what to do for the next weekend, uh, for the for, for our meeting next week. And I think we should vote as a group today because the thing is, we, we didn't have the we didn't have all the information last week. We didn't know whether the hybrid technology was going to work out. I was operating under the assumption that we would be able to get that because we had almost a month lead time, and so I'm frustrated that we couldn't get the technology in place. Um, and I, as one, you know, another note, we get more people on these meetings. We get more, more people on these Zoom meetings than we got in person. So the idea that we're honoring students more effectively in person is to me disingenuous. I think that's- uh, How many people are we getting on either? I mean- I mean, we had 40 people, or over 30 people at the beginning of this meeting, including- Beginning, but how many are here now? Oh, it's the end of the meeting. Yeah, so 18, hmm. so there's- I don't know that it's the end of the meeting. I, I, I'm just saying oh. that's no different than people being there than leaving. If they were on early but aren't on we now, do, we do have what more. We have more if the five hundred, if the five hundred dollars and the microphones could solve the problem, we can try that. But I don't know that you know, uh, even just to have the microphones in the room when if everyone's present or not to have that. Uh, well, that's been, why I said I don't want to spend the money or to ask to spend this money if people are not going to be on board. That's my thing. Yeah, yeah. Everybody and to I be also think the money. And so, Marissa, just to remind. I mean, just so the board's aware, I believe it was Vera and Steve who offered to donate yes. uh, equipment, which that that kind of removes the money element for the district. And I, I'm sure we would all appreciate that. And Albert's aware of that. It was just more of logistically, does it make sense? And he knew he wasn't going to be here this week or next week. So we, Steve and I are, are also asking that question. What does next week look like? Steve McLaughlin, Steve Burns, and I. And what, mm -hmm. what's next week look like because we certainly don't have a tech guy you know our, our network administrator our tech guy to set it up and figure it out anyhow so um okay we so honoring my recommendation would be i'm sorry my recommendation no. then would be the table this discussion until after we can either decide on a timeline for the acquisition of those tech items 
and then how quickly we can incorporate those into our normal process and we can do that until after the 18th so uh albert will not be here on the 18th so that will have to be a discussion that is we can we can um so the next meeting won't be streamed online. This at our next workshop. The next, the next vote meeting where we're voting won't be accessible to the public online. Well, it would that, be. That's very because, frustrating. No, but we, we wouldn't have it be accessible in a hybrid way. It would be more accessible where we set up a laptop and just stream it. Yeah. It, it, it won't be accessible in a way where you can actually hear what people are saying. Well, that is the challenge when we set it up that way before and it was muffled and, and there were issues. Yeah. So we're serving the community worse. Yeah. Just a, no sense well, uh, we're serving the community, but by being elected officials and doing our jobs, there's transparency. It's there. We bet the you know, yeah. And I think that actually, you, I think that everybody misunder misunderstood me. So what I was saying was that for the today's meeting and then the 18th, we will continue as is, like this, like this. virtually. Okay. In the meantime, we would then discuss, because at that point in time, Albert will be back. You can provide, you and Vera can provide a quick turnaround time as to how quickly we could acquire the, the items that were required for that and how and how quickly we can incorporate those into our process. And hopefully by the next workshop session in September, we will have clear direction on how we can utilize what we have in on hand for that voting session in September. That's what I was saying. Oh, hold on one second. I, uh, Amy, are you there? Need some legal advice. Yep. Was it I'm here. Are you looking for Amy Guerin? Yes. yes, Amy. Uh, I think you know where I'm going with this. The advertisement said that the 18th would be in person. Uh, it's next Wednesday. What? You'd have to re-advertise. I'd have to re-advertise. My problems with papers would not be able to print it. How much notice do I have to give? 48 hours? Yes. I'll have to check. I can't guarantee the board that I can provide adequate notice, given I have to check with the newspapers. Okay, so why don't you provide that to us? Let us know if you can give us that, if you can give that eight hours notice. If you can, then we will. Or 48, 48 hours, yeah. Yeah, and then if not, then we're going to have to go as is and deal with the how it's going to be, unfortunately, because well, that's the guys in the hopes that we have proper technology to prepare for it. So for Amy, uh, Marissa, because I think there might be a solution to this. For Amy, I, I know that in the past, you know, I've heard BAs and superintendents say, well, if we get it to the newspapers, let's say tomorrow, that even if the newspaper doesn't advertise it, we, we, get, we got it to them with ample time. I mean, does that count for anything? Not really. It's the whole idea of advertising is that the notice is posted 48 hours in advance. So it's not about your effort. You could send in the ad a week ahead of time, but if the public doesn't have 48 hours notice, it's disingenuous mm. to say you've complied. Got it. So if we if we prepare something like that for the newspaper tomorrow, I don't I, I mean I don't know how quickly they can do it, but we're talking about getting it out by Monday. So I'm not sure Monday, you well, print. you're meeting. It, well, it yeah. The the whole point is That's when do they print it? Yeah. Yes. What is what paper do you advertise in? That only what does it only run once a week? Most of them do. Uh, but that, that's the issue. Well, so we Burlington County Times and the Courier Post. Those so, are daily. Yeah. Are they daily? So that's what yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. And they post I'm used to all, weekly news every, every day of the week. There's posts. We might, we really might be okay because I remember we did this before, Amy, where we were we were shifting it around at the last minute because of new COVID restrictions. We were in person, and then we decided it was going to be virtual, and we did have to make a last minute decision to shift it to virtual. So, okay. So, but the. I understand what you're saying, but I think if you and Steve have the ability to advertise, to put in, tomorrow is Thursday, you put it in tomorrow, it gets run on Friday, or worst case scenario, run on Monday, Monday. you're still yeah. good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, exactly. That's what I was trying to look for from you, Amy. I'm, uh, to be very honest, I'm used to weekly newspapers. So in our two previous districts, we had no shot at this. Um, daily newspapers does make it a little bit, a little bit more feasible, for sure. Yeah. All right, so we'll give that a try. Yeah, I Except think that's I, a good compromise say, considering. Yeah. So, I, so Marissa, just just for the sake of understanding here, it's the will of the board that Stephen and I make this effort to get this advertisement out. Yes. Oh, I'll give that first thing one morning. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That is the 
the wish of the board and myself. Absolutely. And then that way we'll have time to develop a better plan for technology to help get us the product in hand so that we can move this forward. Um, mm. Also, like if you would if you wouldn't mind, Joe, to make sure that you reach out to Stephen and Vera. Please CC me on there with Albert, so that way we can be sure that we get this moving in the right direction as quickly as possible, so that we don't end up with the same situation next month. Because obviously, next month is an important month. The children are back in school. So, so I guess my que my question about this is: Does the board want to move forward with this idea of a hybrid, knowing that Albert does not fully agree with it? And we we told him we said agree or not, we might need to move forward with that. So I mean, what are the? What was his rationale as to why he did not agree? It just feels like it's not going to be a streamlined approach to a board meeting, and that we're not going to be able to conduct our business effectively. Which, if we if we look at this meeting. This is not perfect by any means, but we're conducting it far more effectively than if we were all in the same room and we had an audience online as well as an audience in person. It just makes it more challenging and it doesn't make it impossible. Just he, he felt like it was not going to be a streamlined, effective approach. And that's just based on his understanding of the tech. Now, Steve, Steve Burns has experience doing this hybrid setup and also gave his opinion that it, it felt a bit messy when he was doing it in his previous district. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we did it in um, my previous district, it was a little bit different than what we were talking, but it was, what we did was the board was in person, all public comment was virtual. So we all sat in a circle six feet apart. This is, this is a long time ago, six feet apart with laptops and headphones so that we could kind of see each other and talk to one another to a certain degree throughout the meeting, but we were all on Zoom so the public could see us. That's how we conducted it. Um, now, I know as I was leaving the district, they were moving towards implementing uh, where the public could view them, but could not, pretty much what we're talking about, could view the meeting, but or would not have access to public comment. You know, it would have to be in person for public comment. Um, that's what they were moving to probably in August, September of this year. And the school boards association, uh, many districts have had that same problem, which is trying to, what you think you might gain, you don't. You know, it, it, it still is, there's other problems. And when you have two audiences, the audience in the room and an audience out, it, it really takes a while to even get used to that, to running something like that. Because there's been, like I say, trainings and um, on that. It's it's tough. And the thing is, our expectations of what we're going to get may be different than when we end up getting. It's just, I, I, the only I thing just, that uh, the board has, to, the, the only thing that we have to lose is me and Steve will lose some money. That's it. If we try it, that's the only thing we have to lose. So we might as well just try it out. Yeah, and I'll, I don't throw it, I've been, I mean, I have deep experience running you know, live streams with complicated audio setups. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I could guide Albert through the process of getting this set up and running it reliably. I do have a practical question uh, from Mr. Mersinger. I mean, is it possible for, Actually, I just don't know the answer to this. Is it possible for me to you know, arrange a meeting with Albert, you know, let's say a week ahead of the meeting and go through the technical setup and, and troubleshoot? Or is that a no-no because I would I'm actually- So, yeah. 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 so, no, a, so uh, I was gonna say, it's that, not a typical thing for right. board members to engage yeah. staff members that way. It doesn't yeah. mean that we can't make some kind of arrangement. We just have to make sure that um, it's, it's, for example, let's say Marissa, you and Marissa were going to be involved in a meeting with me, Albert, and Steve about technology. That would kind of be appropriate, but but it's there, there's always a little bit of a, you know kind of a gray area with this. I mean, we've had board members who want to volunteer in the school, but there there are um, rulings from New Jersey school boards and the ethics commission about that. We've had board members that that do interact directly and work with staff members through the committee process, like when we had Casey on the curriculum committee. So in this situation, I mean, I'm not, it's definitely not a hard no, it's just a matter of 
the understanding has to be that the board members are not administrators when it comes to the staff members. Yeah, That's, okay. yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. And what I was going to ask and see if it was possible, if the, the board presently would be okay with myself and Stephen, Joe, Steve, Stephen Burns, and Albert having a discussion offline, not during the Committee of the Whole, to discuss this more in depth so that we can move this endeavor forward in a positive way to the best of our ability. Because I truly want to hear what Albert says as well. I value his opinion and his expertise. So I would like to understand what his concern with streamlining is because obviously I'm not techie. So when he says streamline, I can assume one thing, but I don't know truly what he's putting out there. So I would like a bit more information and I don't want to delay the process to where we're still talking about this in October and November. Ideally, I'd like to get this moving and solidified by next workshop. We can certainly do that. I made a note that as long as as long as the board wants to move forward with that, certainly there could be a meeting amongst the four of us that you just mentioned, as well as Albert, where we discussed all of the logistics related to this topic. Is anybody opposed to us reaching out to Albert via Joe, via Mr. Mersinger? to get that meeting scheduled? Is anybody opposed to that? Because I want to make sure the full board is in agreement that that is an acceptable action for two members of the board to take. I think that's a great idea. Great idea, I agree. No opposition from me. No opposition from me. Awesome, thank you. I don't know where Harry went. Uh, Vera, are you comfortable with that decision? Yep. Um, I appreciate that. I'm Harry? sorry, I had, I had to leave the room for a moment. That's fine, that's fine. Are you comfortable with myself and Stephen, in addition to Joe, Mr. Burns, and Albert having a meeting offline to discuss the technology that is needed to get us to be to have a, the ability to have a hybrid situation? Are you comfortable? I was asking all board members to be sure that they are comfortable with that directive that we were going to do that. I'm comfortable with it. Hopefully, we can do it to the best of our ability. That's what I think. That's my expectation. Yeah. It'll be to the best of our ability. And, right. and Cameron, you might have some input. You know, you know, you're pretty well versed with some of the technology. Yeah. What are you, what's yeah, your if thoughts? I can help. I will. So, also, what I would suggest, and what can happen, is that after that meeting, Joe give a brief summary of what had been discussed, so that we're so that we're all in the know as to how we're moving forward, and to continue the committee, the whole objective, just yeah. the follow up to that meeting, because I do Good. want everybody informed and knowledgeable about what process we're taking while well, separately, but as a whole as well. Yeah. And I think Marissa, at the very least, what Vera said uh, does make a lot of sense that if Vera and Steven are contributing to the district in this way, and we are able to experiment with this option, there's nothing to lose for the district. And now I would feel bad for Vera and Steven if they're donating something to the district that we don't end up using that way. but. The point is that if if they are willing to donate and we're willing to experiment, I think we do need to move forward with that discussion with Albert and see what we can do. Right. And, also no, and I agree. And I'm, I'm extremely appreciative for that donation and the, 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 the thought of the donation and the offer of the donation so that we could move this forward in that format. Um, but again, I do want to be able to, to be sure that we spend your money wisely and not frivolously. So I want to have that conversation to be sure that what we're doing is truly the right thing to do moving forward. But I do appreciate the both of you as super. And I think that I don't have any problem with Steven, you know, working directly with Albert, if he knows how it works and he's, it's like someone saying here, this is what I'm giving you, but let me show you how it works. I mean, so, that's yeah, so I'm we'll, at it. we can do that in that meeting. I, I'd like to be present and I would like um, Joe and Steve to be present as well. I'd like us all to be present so that the communication moving out to the whole board yeah. will be uniform and that we all have um, opinions brought forward as well. I think it's super yeah. important. And I think that it'll be a great opportunity for us to have a, a good discussion. Sounds good. Onward. Awesome. And I appreciate the open-mindedness of all parties this evening. It is all new. It's a new format. All discussion is being brought up, but I appreciate everybody doing it in a respectful way. It is a great, it's a great thing. New beginnings is an awesome thing. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question and maybe suggestion. 
for our big sign in front of Pearson School, is that used to advertise board meetings? The big light up sign? And if it's not used for it, can it be used for it? So my goal is just greater and greater public participation. It's, um, I believe it is. I mean, that's actually managed by Karen Hoser who works in our board office and does a fantastic job. Um, I, I would have to look at the list of things that she puts on there, but no matter what, uh, as long as the board wishes it, we can actually, we, we can completely start advertising if not. Now, what I will say is, I know a lot of people drive by. I don't know how relevant the board meeting is to every person that possibly works or even lives in Delanco. Some of them might not find it relevant, but I send a message directly to hundreds of recipients every time we're having a board meeting. So it is important to know that we are getting the word out about board meetings better than ever. It is a courtesy message that gets sent. That's not the official notice. Uh, but it's a question of whether people want to participate, whether it's relevant to them, whether they're excited about the topic of education or public service, uh, you name it, all sorts of things that are happening because you as board members are serving the public. Uh, you just never know what people are interested in. So I understand that we can, we can look into that with Karen. I, I believe I one of the goals was community outreach that we were yeah. discussing community outreach. So this would be a part of community outreach. So yeah, I agree with Vera. If there's an opportunity for us to get that on the electro electronic messaging board in the front of the school, that would be great. Um, I think the more visibility to what's going on is wonderful. I don't think it would be a detriment. I think it would only be a positive. We have, we have that big digital sign for a reason. So, you know. Absolutely. So we might use it. as well utilize it for something positive. Like it has, but it hasn't been. But for something I mean, that Positive. There are all sorts of messages that go up there and, and definitely important dates have been put up there. I just don't know that we've had board meeting dates up there. So that's, that's, that's an easy one. Awesome. Good point to bring up. Thank you. Is there anything in new business that wants, that we should bring up and discuss prior to our meeting on the 18th? Um, is it possible to archive our public packets? I don't believe we do that now. You, uh, are you asking if could we I don't I don't know who oh. knows the answer to that because I was looking for um like I know Mr. Mersinger is now the treasurer uh before mm -hmm. Vicky was the treasurer and so no, I was no, just no. that's not that's not correct um Mr. Burns you said that Mr. Mersinger now is the tre is is what? in the treasurer it's, position all right correct? let's all right let's let's back it up a minute Vicky was not the treasurer. Uh, James Can't was not the treasurer. B business administrators are not permitted to be the treasurer. Okay. Um, who was the treasurer when Vicky was with us? I was the treasurer. What you you gave a statement with two parts. One part was not correct. Okay. Thank you. I didn't. I wasn't sure because I know when she got the surety bond from Barclay. And I asked her about it. She's like, oh, that's given to treasurers, but Delanco doesn't have a treasurer. I, I mean, this is in an old email, so that got me confused. Well, so, I have okay. to be bonded. The business minister has to be bonded. Okay. Is that what you're so, referring to? The, so I'm the still in charge of $10 million. The treasurer topic, Vera, I know you've been asking about it. It's a very old one. The district did it to save money. It was $5,000 a year that the district saved to not pay a separate treasurer and have me review the report and sign my name to a report. So we were, and, and I don't want to under, I, I really don't want, want to say anything negative about anyone, but in the past, you know, the board asked the question, do we want to pay 5,000 additional dollars here for oh, something? I didn't even want to talk about that topic. I I'm not even interested in that. I'm just interested, is it possible to archive the public I know, but, it, but in that question, you asked a seemingly random one about the treasurer. No, I, I just because I was looking up something regarding who was the treasurer and I couldn't find. I'm getting July a little confused now. Yet. I don't know about the public, if we can clarify this. Yeah. Well, we can just focus on my uh, my basic question, which is, yeah, can but we archive the public packets? When That's you say are they asking. archived, we do have minutes and we do have packets and Steve Burns and the business office, as the board secretary, you know, he would take care of 
making sure all of the no, items. I mean, like online, are they archived online where I can access like a public packet from last year? That's what I want to know. Or is, do. I don't think I couldn't see that in my Google Drive. That's what I was looking for. We do not have that, but since you've been a board member, uh, you've had direct access to anything, but prior to being a board member, no, you didn't have access to those. And those might've been in a folder that James Heiser was the owner of, or even Joanne D'Angelo before him. Okay, so, but can we make those um, publicly accessible archived public packets? Well, I think you're asking a fairly big question with a lot of work for our board secretary. Uh, so it's, yeah, I don't okay. know. Can we archive them yes no, forward? Can we archive them yeah. forward would be a little bit easier because one reason why I use Google is because once I give a link, it's the link, right? So of course I have the confidential versus the public. Yeah, I would only, I'm only talking about the public and we don't really have to decide anything. I was just throwing it out there because I was oh, looking for some information from, from July and I couldn't find it in my email. Well, then I start, what, what I would like to do there is develop a solution because I, I actually support it. Um, I like the idea of having, like, for example, in one of my previous decisions, we definitely had had eboards for that stuff. Um, in another district, we did not, but I, I don't have any problem with it. I just got to figure out, since I have the Google folders all set up, how could I, because there's other stuff in those folders. I, I it could be it seen. could be archived online. I mean, the answer is yes, it can be. The question What's is forward? directing me to direct our board secretary to do this. And I'm not saying that it can't be done. I just know that what is the purpose Steven, of it? Steven's been here for for less than two months, fewer than two months, and we had Vicky before him. Where to now? We're gonna we do have access to Vicky's files and James's files. But if we go back to Joanne D'Angelo, oh yeah, I'm not saying go back a long aren't, time. Aren't I'm saying to move forward. No, yeah, I like yeah, to yeah. move forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me figure out a way. Let me figure out a way here, mm -hmm. um, because I have everything in Google Folders. It should be doable at this point. You know, I probably just copy the Google Folders into an archive folder. There has to be an easy way of doing this. That's why I used Google when I first came aboard, and, and I was talking to Joe like Joe. Let me change this the way we're doing the agenda. I'm not going to label PDF files. I, I'm just going to take up too much time. Right. Use Google. I can do it this way. And it seems like it's working pretty well. So I have a folder. Joe, I think if I just create a new folder that's accessed by the public at all times, I can just pop them in there. And actually, yeah, if I do it that way, yeah. the same link for every agenda would always be in there. I wouldn't have to provide any new links to the public because I always put them before the meetings. Oh, well, that would be great. And just so label I, the folders. Yeah. Yes. And, um, this is why Google is lovely because it's going to make things more seamless. I well, think I have you. a solution, but I, I like the idea. But let's do it moving forward. I'll go back to July first, or you know, July since I've been here. Um, going okay, back I appreciate that. I I didn't want to make a, a lot of new work because you know that's that's costly for the district too. And on that note of um, cost, I was wondering whose decision was it to. Um, you know, I love having uh, Mrs. Gar Ms. Garin, I can ask her questions, but I know it is it is also a cost, an hourly cost to have, uh, you know, a lawyer here every meeting. We didn't used to have that. So whose decision was that? Vera, we had a board meeting in which the meeting yes. following that, we had to have an executive session to discuss board member behavior. You were part of that meeting and you were part of that discussion. So. I think it's, you know, we certainly can't reveal all the details, but you were already part of that discussion. I don't believe, I think my behavior has been exemplary. I've I'm not talking a about lot that. Of I never mentioned Vera Darmo's behavior. I said board member. I think our, all of the behavior of the board members has been, if there's been any problems, they've been corrected. And I don't think that one incident um, justifies the cost to the district. Ms. Guerin is giving us invaluable information, but it could be done in a telephone call where all the questions were written down and in a much shorter time frame. So, I, will, I, I would disagree with that. And I would say there's been far more than just one incident. Correct. And I think that until 
I think that we can keep it as is moving forward because it has been wonderful the past couple of meetings. It has been seamless. It has been a respectful environment. And I think that we will continue to do this moving forward until we get this committee all really solidified as to how we're going to proceed forward, perhaps at that point in time, and we have a good set of parameters and boundaries, then we can revisit this topic. I okay, second I that. Just, I'm just speaking Thank out you. against it as an unnecessary financial burden to the district. I just want Absolutely. to be well, then you need to, you need to think about how you and all of us board members have to think about how our behavior contributes to the overall board and our either our ability to work together or to be split. And one of the things we're doing is creating um, going forward a board of the whole. And now what I've learned over 50 years in education and uh, a few more of life is that you need to get help when you need it. And we need the help now. And I think it would be interesting to to hear what our representative or legal representative has to say about that. Frankly, I I work for the board, um, so I attend if the board wants me to attend. I work by telephone if the board wants me to work by telephone. Um, I work with your designated representatives, which is usually your board president, your superintendent, and your business administrator. I have plenty of clients where I go to their meetings every month, sometimes twice a month, and sometimes some of their committee meetings. Um, I also have plenty of districts where I get the occasional phone call and I don't go to meetings unless an issue comes up. Quite frankly, you can use me however you want to use me, as much or as little as you want to use me. Once again, I work for the board. Thank you for okay. clarifying that for us. Thank you. As I stated, it is my directive that we continue as is until further notice to be sure that we are clear with our parameters and boundaries of how we're going to move forward with this committee of the whole. There are still a lot of unknowns, and I want to be sure that we have those unknowns answered in a quick and timely fashion so that we're as productive as possible. Is there anything more to discuss in new business? Well, Marissa, if we were to go back to the August 11th agenda, there was an old business item as well as a new business item that I put on there. Um, and I both of them are pretty quick. What were they? One was the safe return plan oh, yeah. for the school year, and the other one was the Strauss SMA alerts. So I just wanted to briefly let the board know that the safe return plan uh, was developed back in June. The reopening committee was part of that process. Um, it's my goal and my plan to reconvene the reopening committee again some point over the next couple of weeks to review the safe return plan in light of some of the new guidance that we're receiving. We've been told that the health department will be issuing new guidance uh, over the coming weeks. That new guidance is probably going to adhere to the executive order that just took place recently about requiring masks for students and staff members in the school buildings, with certain exceptions, of course. So when it comes to the safe return plan, I just want the board to be aware that we are going to be following the guidance from the health department. And uh, within the county, before the executive order, there was a certain splintering effect that took place among districts where some districts said, we, we will strictly adhere to the health department's guidance and other districts said, well, we would rather do it this way and they would explain why. And some were using their own data, they would have doctors come in and provide data and so on. So I want the board to be aware that I, I've, I've communicated with numerous colleagues with our school physician. I have, an, I have a, I've been emailing, but I also have a phone call with her tomorrow. I've talked to the health department, Burlington County Health Department directly. And the, the idea of the executive order requiring masks before that even happened, uh, that was going to be the way we were moving forward uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, simply because that's what we were being guided to do by the health department and our school physician. So um, just wanted to make the board aware of that. But then the executive order came and we're going to be following that executive order just like we should. It's just a matter of 
receiving various types of guidance over time. So we might receive a new executive order over the next few weeks. We might receive a new guidance document from the health department, which they said is coming. The Department of Ed published a document back in June, which is still in effect as well. So there are a number of different sources of information that we're drawing from, but districts prior to the executive order were, were not all on the same page with this. And some were saying masks are optional. Some were saying masks uh, are only required for those who aren't vaccinated. Some were saying masks are required for all and so on. So that um, there wasn't a lot of consistency, although there were different pockets of districts that were agreeing with each other. So I'm not sure what that's going to look like if the executive order changes, but you know, we, we, we are going to follow the guidance from the health department. That's my recommendation to the board. And it's my hope that the board wouldn't object to that, that if the health department says, here's what we're recommending for school districts, that we wouldn't object to it because the CDC and then the New Jersey Department of Health and then our County Department of Health, it all filters down to us eventually. And it's based on whatever research and science that they're doing, not based on my own personal opinion. So I, I just wanted the board to be aware of that. There's, there's a lot of thought and discussion going into these topics, distancing, uh, how we're going to be serving lunches and the schedule for that. What does the bus look like, et cetera. Um, and it's and it's it's really all being worked out, but a lot of it is not going to look so different from last year, except for here. Here's the big difference: we're running a full school day with lunches, and students are going to be in the school building with their teachers, unless there's some kind of quarantine situation in which students need to be out of the building, and then there would be some kind of virtual setup for those students. So. Those are the things that we're navigating right now. But uh, the plan is full day for students with lunches. Masks will be worn in the building with certain exceptions, though, for, for meals and for uh, being outside for recess, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it's, it's still not drastically different from what we did last year with the exception of what the schedule looks like. And that's a benefit. It's a benefit to have the kids in the school for longer. It's a benefit to have the teachers interacting with them face to face. And like I said, you know, conducting the business of a board meeting to me is drastically different from being a teacher in a classroom, which I was for seven years. And then I was a principal after that. And, you know, it's it, what the teachers are doing, having that contact with the students in person. It's just so important. And it's my hope that we can maintain that throughout the year without us getting another order saying we must go virtual or something like that. So we'll see what happens. But right now, the safe plan is, is based on guidance from the health department, guidance from the Department of Ed, and the executive order. So I don't know if the board has any questions about that. I have a question. Does the mass mandate apply to our Board of Education meetings? So based on my understanding of this, right, that if we were going to have a board meeting in person with children present and adults present, we're in the school building, that yes, we would need to wear masks. Mm -hmm. um, in, my, in my school, when they brought the kids back in, they had to have some lunches outside under tents in order to space kids out. And that won't be possible during the cold winter months. So is, is there any plan to um, have kids eating in the classroom? And then um, I know we were talking about maybe hiring more aides to, to cover because I don't know how they're gonna be spaced out all in the cafeteria. Well, well I'm not the, sure, the, maybe they could be. The plan, we, we are working on that plan and the plan is to have um, additional lunch periods. So for example, Walnut's lunch period, uh, there was one lunch recess period in years past. We're looking at having it be two lunch periods and two recesses recess periods. And then likewise for Pearson, where, um, you know, Mr. Conti did have an extensive amount of lunch and recess period, but I'm working on it with Mr. Caracation now uh, to have a sufficient number of lunch periods and recess periods so that we have spacing for students in the cafeteria. And it's also, so also so that it logistically makes sense because it, we, we certainly can't have too many kids getting lunches at once, or there's not going to be enough time so we definitely have to have the appropriate amount of lunch periods. So Steve Burns is involved in that, along with the principals and I, with Tim Allen, our director of facilities, guidance that we're receiving. So um, we're, we're looking at outdoor options as a possibility. 
We're looking at classrooms as a possibility, not a plan, but just a possibility. So um, that's that's something we, we're working on. Okay, that, that makes tomorrow. sense. Do the meeting tomorrow with NutraServe, yep. two representatives of NutraServe, as well as principals and myself and Mr. Mercer, uh, to further discuss discussions that have already occurred over the last couple of weeks. So, okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. And we, we just need to be careful about micromanaging because, you know, we're talking, about, we're projecting a winter, we're projecting what will happen, and it, it's, it's micromanaging. That's what the administration does. They... And that's what I thought I heard Mr. Merzinger ask for, which was basically for us to approve whatever is coming from the health department. Am I correct with that? Well, yes, definitely. So if there is some kind of revision to the safe return plan, it's not going to be based on my personal opinion. It's going to be based on the guidance from the governor, the health department, the Department of Ed, sometimes the Department of Agriculture when it comes to meals. So these are all things that I, I'm not going to personally make a determination unless no, and you shouldn't are, be. You th shouldn't th be there are logistical decisions that need to be made. The health department's not going to tell us exactly no. how we should. I, I agree. I don't think you so or on, any but, other superintendent yeah. should be put in that spot because yeah. it's going to be, oh, yeah, 50 percent of the people. That's a wise decision. The other 50 percent. Oh, that's a bad decision and mm -hmm. vice versa. And yeah. Um, it's a board. The board, you know, um, it, it, what you're asking us for, I, I think it's a good idea to just go because they're going to opt on the part of safety. And if people have political agendas or trouble understanding science or understanding things, there are invisible things in the world and how things actually occur. Well, so be it, you know. So that's what I would like to uh, to go along with what Mr. Mersinger is saying and anyone else, their opinions, you know, about what's coming up because it's coming up not in the winter, it's coming up now, it's coming up between now and when school opens. And, and really, Harry, think, you know, and, and for the whole board and the public, the big challenge for a year and a half was how are we going to serve lunches? And that's still the question because in the, the previous year and a half, number one, we went fully virtual and the idea of search, uh, serving lunches was, well, we're going to do a meal distribution day for multiple days. And then when we came back in and we were doing a hybrid, uh, we, we, we kept the meal distribution day because we had a sh shortened day for instruction. But now yeah. we have a full instructional day Meals need to be served during the school day. And that is the logistical challenge for every single district out there because you need staff members to supervise. You need the proper, uh, the amount of space between students in the, in the cafeteria and so on and so forth. So there are all these logistical aspects of that, that um, that's not even the, the instructional part. You know, the instructional part, our teachers did an amazing job. They're going to continue to do an amazing job. The big question on every superintendent's mind is, how are we serving lunch? <laughs> you know, so, and, and that's, and it's, it's amazing, but that's been the question for a year and a half or more. Yeah. And after, after 50 years in education, it seems like education is boiled down to one question, mask or no mask. <laughs> you know, forget the real educational issues, student improvement, what we're about is it's pretty existential mask or no mask. Well, right now the answer is mask and that's what that's what the governor says so we're going to follow the, the the state requirement so but that's all i have right now about the safe return plan that we already developed it the document is available on our website it was shared i'm going to reshare it but again there might be some revisions over the coming weeks based on new guidance that we receive uh another item that was on there marissa if if you're fine with me moving on to the next one yeah the straw says may Yes. All right. So, so the board in the past, we had a policy committee where the policy committee would review certain Strauss SMA updates, these alerts that we would receive. So my recommendation for moving forward is uh, we, we already have a couple of alerts that, you know, we're a little bit behind on them, but I feel like it's, it's something where I could review the policies 
I could make my notes about the policies, share them with the full board because we don't have a committee now and say, okay, you know, what, what does the full board think about these? They can be fully discussed. They're going to go through first reading and second reading and adoption. It's just a matter of rather than having a policy committee discuss it, the board would discuss it. So my, my plan for timeline was to basically get a lot of policies on the agenda for September, October, November, that type of timeline, because we have a couple of alerts that we need to get to. Uh, some of those alerts are just very basic updates to policies, and other ones are not so basic that might require some discussion. But either way, I just wanted to make sure that the board was okay with that process, where I'm going to review them, I'm going to make my notes, I'm going to give my suggestions, and then the board reviews them and and says, well, here's how we want to do it. Because ultimately, the board is a governing body, a policy-making body, where I carry out what the board wants. So even though I'm going to be giving suggestions and recommendations, the board might want to go in a different direction on a policy, and that's perfectly fine. That's how the policy committee typically operates. So if we look at the history of that, you know, only two board members can be remote and all that, that was what the policy committee at the time wanted in that policy. It wasn't my personal opinion. It wasn't the opinion of every board member, but that's what the committee wanted at the time based on what they felt was needed. But now the full board's going to be looking at policies. And what I would recommend is, you know, some policies are just what we call boilerplate. You can, you can read every word if you want to, but some of them are just very basic standard policies that you can say, okay, we trust the Strauss May language for that. And then other ones are going to be read more in depth because it's a topic that requires more discussion. And that's just the nature of, of these policies. So as long as the board's okay with it, I was going to review them and start sharing them with the full board over the next month or so, so we can start getting them on the agenda. Yes, that I makes sense to me. That's great. All right. That's, I agree. Yeah. All right. That's And that's typically what I did with the committee. It's just a matter of doing it with the full board now. Okay. That's, that's all I have. And I really wanted to say that because I didn't want to just put a bunch of policies on the agenda and hope that the board was fine with it. That's never how we would do it. It's you go through a process of reviewing it, discussing it, and so on. Nope, sounds good to me. All right. I don't have anything else then. So is there any public on comment on a non-agenda item? I don't know if there's any comments that anybody has. Do we, do we still have people on the line? We do. I, I don't, don't see any, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Well then if we don't have any hands raised, that is fine. So then we can, do we have a need to go into executive session? I don't believe so. I don't believe that there was any topics brought up that are relevant for that. Steve and I discussed this prior to the meeting and we didn't have anything to discuss with the board, but there was the one question raised earlier where I shared some confidential student information with the board uh, earlier in the meeting. Does, does saw that. Is there Thank a need you, to, Jeff. right? Yeah, so I think that that's, I think that is sufficient information provided that we don't necessarily have to go into executive session to discuss it further. Um, certainly that board member can reach out or any board member for that matter can reach out and discuss things more if they have questions regarding that email. Um, if there are no further questions and no desire to go into executive session at this point in time, I make a, a request a motion to adjourn. I second that. Yeah, I'll so move to either order. Okay, so Stephen will have moved, had made the motion and Harry has second. It was just flip flop. <laughs> um, so Thank then the meeting is adjourned and I appreciate everybody's willingness to work together this evening. It was a great opportunity and experience. It was very Thank pleasurable, you. very pleasurable. Is, I'm sorry, this is Amy, just a technicality. Um, you have to actually vote. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask, how do we have to? Yeah, okay, no, I know, but we, I know, I didn't get to that point. To get out of the oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. I didn't mean to jump the gun. No, yeah, no, 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 but no also, worries. how do we, within, do we do by consensus or voting on everything within oh, the- Oh, you can do- um, Looks like we were doing consensus, what, and if there's that? an issue, yeah. uh, this is what I'm proposing, that we do by consensus if there's an issue, 
we vote on it, and that majority rules. And that no, the only thing you have, the only thing you're voting on, you have a pending motion. To, so the only the discussion, meeting. you have a pending motion to adjourn. So the only mm -hmm. discussion, if there is any discussion, is whether or not you really want to adjourn. But um, just by technicality, I thought you were ending the meeting without a vote. And that, and I apologize. That yeah, I that has no, that has to be done. But I, I had that question. I was just going to let it wait till the, you know, the next work okay. session. But, but we had yeah. to establish the rules within the work session to make us more productive. That's what I'm looking to do, and and to guide us. And that's what so we because can... we did just kind of by consensus. We didn't have any votes during, but I think that would uh, be helpful. And now I second. Steve's motion. <laughs> oh, okay, no problem. And are there any questions or comments in regards to the motion to adjourn? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? The motion carries. The meeting is adjourned, and I appreciate your time and and all. Thank, thank you. Appreciate. It. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Joe thank you. And Steve, and fellow board members. Thank you. Yeah. That was that felt Recording good. Recording stopped.